Warning. The world has now become too dangerous for anything less than utopia. That's a quote from John Platt. He was right. Great point, John. Yeah, he actually advocated in the 1950s for universal libraries to be in everyone's living rooms, but he advocated for using oh, yeah. microscopic books as right. a way to achieve that. So you have like tiny books and you get like tweezers out. And I mean, in a way, a smartphone is like having microscopic books. They're just the size of bits and bytes on a hard drive kind of thing. Yeah, no, he was on the right course for sure. Yeah. You do save materials having tiny books. Welcome back to the Seriously Wrong Podcast. That was Aaron and I'm Sean. You might remember us from last time, or if this is your first episode, welcome. This actually is the 300th episode, but that is a, you can start with this one. Yeah, it's a fine first episode. This isn't like The Sopranos, where it's a strong continuity and you have to start at the beginning to understand what's going on. It's not like that. It's, not at all. It's more like The Simpsons. You can just pop in on any episode and you'll understand what's up. It just made me think of like, we're in season nine now of Seriously Wrong. <laughs> it's like we're like The oh, Simpsons. No, it's episode to go downhill. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, uh, here's this week's big idea. Here's the big thought. It is possible to, and I originally heard this idea from Buckminster Fuller, but a variety of people have made this point. It's possible to have a higher standard of living for every human being on Earth, all 8 billion of us on this beautiful planet could have a higher quality of life than we currently do, while at the same time we could work within the limits of nature, work within the limits of the planet, not bust through planetary boundaries. We could meet our ecological commitments while at the same time meeting and exceeding our social commitments to one another to have a, a rich, free, vibrant life for every person on Earth. And literally every single person on Earth could have a better life while at the same time we meet our environmental commitments. That's the idea. It's, it's ecological luxury. Today's episode of Seriously Wrong is brought to you by humanity's inherent desire to chuck garbage right in the ocean. And our ability as a species to capture that force for good with ingenuity and ecological thinking. Look. Human beings have an inherent desire to chuck their garbage into the infinite deep of the ocean blue. We all do it. Let's just admit it. I know you might be thinking, hey, I'm not even near the ocean. I don't chuck stuff into it. But remember that chucking garbage on the ground outside almost anywhere will end up in waterways, like rivers and streams, which are then carried out into the ocean. So even chucking your garbage on the ground somewhere in the middle of a continent very likely will end up in the ocean. It's time for a reckoning. We all feed the mighty garbage-eating mouth of the Earth's increasingly dirty oceans. We love it. It's human nature. We've been chucking our crap into the ocean since we were swinging from trees. You're not a horrible person. It's normal. We accept you. Buckminster Fuller said, don't fight forces. Use them. We can use this. All right, here I go. I'm going to dump this huge bag of garbage right into the ocean. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited to this. There's some deep human... Wait, wait, no, no. What about the biodiversity, the microplastics? Obviously, we all struggle with the inexorable urge to throw bag after bag of sweet garbage directly into the ocean blue, but we have to overcome that twisted internal desire. Uh, my friend, haven't you heard of Ecological Luxury Production Directorate 2121? All food packaging has to not only be biodegradable, but be a beneficial food source for the ecosystems into which it's distributed. A bag of garbage like this is basically fish food. Oh wow, our inherent human desire to litter is being used to contribute responsibly to our ecosystem? Wow, 
I guess this really is ecological luxury. Some of this trash packaging even contains the seeds of wildflowers, kelp, azola, and other local plants. Humanity's inherent desire to chuck garbage right into the ocean. Now for the benefit of all. We absolve humanity for their individualistic crime of littering. Litterbugs are pardoned in the ecological criminal court. All is forgiven. Yeah, it's really, it's more up to like institutions to solve these problems and individuals being moralistically judged. Exactly, it's our job as a society to change production if the things that we're producing are ending up in the ocean to make sure that's okay. Now back to our show. Although capitalism has many, many downsides that we talk about all the time, it does have one beautiful upside, which is how good it feels to spend a little money. You know how it feels like when you want to buy something and, oh, then, yeah, you're like, and then you're just like, yep. Yeah, you're I like, I say. deserve it. I, I can afford it and I deserve it. <laughs> it's a little act of self-love to just get something nice for yourself. Yeah, so Seriously Wrong is a listener-supported show. We're able to do the show we do and put the time and effort and thought into it that we do because of the financial support of hundreds, actually over a thousand generous donors who give $6 a month. I like to think of them as like a shield against capitalism for us, like people contributing to a big shield in front of us. And like capitalism is trying to blast us with like poverty and whatever. And they're like, no. Yeah, these noble podcasters freezing in the rain, <laughs> wrapping themselves up like, no, we have to podcast at all costs. And then we're splitting one bean to eat and stuff. But then it's like, oh. And then the patrons come and they look at their financial situation. They're like, well, actually, $6 American a month is not going to... Yeah, you can buy groceries. You don't have to split one bean. You can pay your yeah, rent. Yeah, we'll all put it together. And it's like, oh, and it's like... Shoo, and it's like right. explodes in potential. And that is made possible by listeners like you. Yeah, and we also we do a bonus episode every month. And there's a great community on Discord of cool people to talk to. Yeah, we really appreciate the support, and it is a way to help independent left-wing art, which, in addition to all those great benefits, is something that, you know, I always feel good about it when I uh, <laughs> when I jump into artists and stuff myself, yeah, totally. like I, that I really like. Yeah, so head on over to our Patreon, our Patreon, Patreon. I was thinking of funny ways to say Patreon, but... Didn't have enough time? Uh, yeah, I mean, they could all be funny. <laughs> You have to say them enough times to make it funny. <laughs> yeah, <it's true. laughs> Patreon.com slash seriously wrong. Yeah, and thanks to everyone who already does that. And thanks especially to the people who are doing it as a result of listening to this episode being like, wow, it is time and it feels good. And then they swipe the card and I'm like, ooh, I just got <laughs> access. That feels so good that I, I love paying for stuff. I love these bonus episodes. There's this common sentiment out there that ecology and luxury are on like two opposite ends of a spectrum and to move towards one is to move away from the other. And it makes a sort of intuitive sense. Like a lot of the things considered luxurious in our society are kind of wasteful because everything in our society is produced in sort of like ecologically offensive ways. So to produce more things or things that are just frivolous compared to things other people need to survive. It feels like, oh, it's just like a luxury. Producing things we don't need is the opposite of ecological. So, you know, it kind of makes some sense why people see these things as inherently opposed. But once we started thinking about this, it just felt like there was like a lot of areas where there were sort of surprising overlaps here. And there's certain things where you're like, oh, we could produce this luxurious thing in a more ecological way if we make them more efficient or produce them in different ways from different materials or if we share them in a sort of library setting or if we change other aspects of our broader social culture. There's a lot of avenues we're going to look at this question from about why these two things aren't inherently opposed. Yeah, when we talk about ecological luxury, the term luxury here, it comes from fully automated luxury communism or fully automated luxury gay space communism. There's a bunch of variations on it. It's kind of like LGBT where they keep adding letters. 
the basic argument of the fully automated luxury communists, and I've, I found this idea exciting and fun when I first encountered it. I don't know how many years ago now at this point, but it was kind of a meme. The basic theory of it is that we can use technology to liberate everyone, that we can unleash the productive capacity of humanity in a new way and have like a technological revolution that frees everyone from labor, frees everyone from toil, allows people to relax kick back around all of their own private pools. People have joked like yacht communism and like kind of this promise to the working people of the world, to the global masses, the billions without, is that, you know, under our system, all of your dreams will come true and you'll have a beautiful, wonderful life and you'll get access to all the nicest things in the world. And this is an appealing vision and it's something that can be achieved technologically and that the left could be reinvigorated by this sense of we're not going to, you know, promise people hardship and sacrifice. We're going to promise to outcompete capitalism at doing the things that capitalism has done best in the minds of regular people. And we're going to go to the stars and we're going to use technology. It's going to be like Star Trek and you just press a button and anything you want appears to you right in front of you at all times. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's just, just a, it's amazing. It's a cool idea. I still, I've got a big soft spot in my heart for the fully automated luxury communism, Star Trek, techno stuff. Stuff. But the, the place that it tends to be criticized from is giving insufficient play to the ecological limits of the planet, over-promising, promising things that can't be guaranteed. And particularly, I'm thinking of another utopian current of thought, which we've talked about on the show, which is degrowth. And degrowth and fully automated luxury communism are both subtypes of contemporary utopian intellectual movements. And while degrowth emphasizes the limits of the planet, it also emphasizes the capacity to have genuinely good lives in the context of not overshooting our environmental thing. So if you, you can find um, descriptions of utopian degrowth worlds, if you're a Star Trek communist, there's aspects of it you aren't going to like, but there's also going to be aspects of it that you do like and vice versa for that matter. We're all utopians here. Let's, let's mingle a bit. Let's figure this out. I want to emphasize that they're both utopian movements because I rarely see that said, but it's absolutely 110% true. Like these are the two main contemporary utopian movements. Yeah, they're both utopian movements and they're both like positioned opposite each other as like two conflicting visions. The people who are proponents of one often have kind of like a straw man version of the other that they like to knock down or like, you know, sometimes there's straw many types of people actually exist and they're like legit criticisms to be made. I think we've, you know, maybe came more from a place of fully automated luxury communism early on in the show and have been uh, exploring more degrowth oriented politics. And uh, we don't think there's a contradiction here. Like we think that in order to have a luxurious society in the way fully automated luxury communism people talk about, it has to take place within the confines of the ecological. If it's not ecological, it's going to crash and burn and it's not going to work, right? So in order for a society to truly be luxurious, it has to be ecological. And in order for a society that is ecological to be worth wanting, it has to be something that gives people a good life, a life. Maybe people wouldn't like the term luxurious, but I think like in terms of wanting people to have comfort, wanting people to have not only what they need, but like roses as well, cakes as well, these things that like, for an ecological society to be worth living, there has to be some luxury there. There has to be a little bit luxurious, at least. Yeah, and we have these in-group, out-group dynamics, and sides tend to mix up their good criticisms and their cheap criticisms of each other. Their straw man criticisms get mixed up when you're in the heat of the moment taking sides and so on. But both sides also do claim fully automated luxury communists aren't like, yeah, and just destroy the planet in the process. Who cares? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the other side is like nascent in both of them. Like, like yeah. Yeah. And the, we're saying they're compatible, but I think like, it's not just that like, we're making up some new like compatibility thing. Like they already are compatible when they like, when you really talk to them about it, they're like, yeah, I admit it'd be nice to have nice things, even in a degrowth society, if we can. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, there's a variety of like little conflicts and debates that you could have have along the way yeah, yeah but degrowth is again they're not like well and people have to have shitty lives no comfort all the beds have to be hard all the food has to be bland nothing that people don't need is allowed but we want to self-consciously take these strands figure out what is compatible about them and flesh out this space where places where ecology and luxury aren't just 
not incompatible, but are actively integrated, that are actively not just compatible, but synergistic. Exactly. Breakup texts. I can't do this anymore. All this fully automated luxury, communist, utopian stuff, I thought it was cute. But today at the eco meeting, you embarrassed me so much. Asteroid mining? Really? What did you think we were at the tech bro meeting? Like, God, I just, I can't take it anymore. I'm breaking up with you. Wow, that's funny because I'm breaking up with you. This Puritan eco-shaming, holier-than-thou bullshit is not going to convince anyone of anything. You have a fetish. It's like, I'm smarter than you. I'm going to take away the things you like. Video games are bad. You can't fly on planes anymore. Blah, blah, blah. I have a fetish. You have a fetish. Your fetish is making promises that you can't deliver on. And the only thing you do deliver is more energy throughputs, more energy churn, churning through the planet's resources. I've literally never called for that. I just call for using technology to make people's lives better and promise them something they'd actually want. You know, people like tech. Tech works. Why are we going to have this weird Puritan pretending technology isn't cool thing? Like, technology is cool. Yeah, sure, technology's cool, whatever. Of course it's cool when it actually works, but there are hard ecological boundaries to the planet that we have to hit now and just fantasizing about all this technology in the industry propaganda articles you're constantly sharing it just it ends up turning into procrastination oh look who's concerned about procrastination all of a sudden when was the last time you cleaned the bathroom again wasn't that your job is that procrastination something that you're concerned about or is it just the selective theoretical procrastination that my Facebook shares have somehow encouraged global capitalism to continue being rapacious in the pursuit of profit. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot that my personal Facebook page shapes the planet because I, I didn't sufficiently make everyone not want to read my posts by shitting on the things they like. Speaking of shit, when did you first intend to clean the bathroom? Oh, was I supposed to clean the bathroom? I didn't know. I thought robots were going to do that for us. Don't we have a fully automated luxury bathroom by now? Hasn't Elon Musk invented that yet? Can't Google sell my data of the shape of my bathroom to a robot cleaning company to clean my bathroom for me? Isn't that what you think the future looks like? Isn't that what you want? How dare you compare procrastination on climate to my individual procrastination cleaning the bathroom, which, as you know, is something I really struggle with. Maybe it'd be easier for you to clean the bathroom if we had a kumbaya drum circle white dreads small is beautiful hay bale bathroom with natural compost. We can munch granola, poop in a hole in the ground and braid our white dreadlocks into the branches of trees that connect with the forest. That would cause you to clean the bathroom, hopefully. Yeah, whatever. Poop in hole in the grounds, yeah. Just admit it. You don't even care about the environment at all, do you? As long as you got your toys. No, obviously, I've said like a million times, obviously environment is good. We can use technology to help the environment. I mean, that's one of the great things about technology is it allows you to do cool stuff. Environment is great. Green, wonderful. But you hate technology. You, you Just admit it's cool. Admit it's cool. Of course technology is cool. And I never said it couldn't help the environment. The point is we can only use technology. That helps the environment. You don't seem to care about that. You just want any kind of technology. Throw more technology at it. Doesn't even matter how much energy it takes or how badly it affects the climate. You never incorporate the climate into your analysis. You're basically a climate denier. Look, I'm just saying, it's good to give people nice things and good lives. But of course you can't destroy the environment. Now, I'm just saying that you can't destroy the environment. But of course it's good to give people nice things and good lives, obviously. Oh my god, lol. We are doing that thing again. Just like the therapist said, angrily agreeing with each other. Yeah, you're right. I, the tone's been off this whole time. That's my fault. Obviously these differences are reconcilable. We're both committed to pretty much the same thing. We just have different focuses. What do you say? Want to give it another go? And that is why you are the yin to my yang. The other spectrum on the same 
utopian continuum. Looks like our luxury communist and degrowth ideas are pretty compatible, after all. Yeah, pretty compatible. Kiss me, you animal. (laughs) (laughs) There goes the the lovely couple. (laughs) I always knew they'd end up together. Perfect for each other. They're like two utopian angels. Two puzzle pieces that fit. Salt and pepper. Macaroni and cheese. Push, 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 push. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we've had a safe birth. Yeah. What are you gonna name the beautiful child? Why, I think we'll name it Ecological Luxury. Yeah. Ooh, beautiful. A beautiful androgynous name. I do want to acknowledge just at the outset that. Obviously, not all luxuries are ecological, and that like saying ecological luxury doesn't mean like every single luxury can be made ecological. I think you offhandedly referenced a private pool in everyone's backyard a moment ago, and like obviously, you can't actually do that because not everybody like there's not enough space for everybody to have their own pool. Uh, in the we can there's no point in building eight billion pools, <laughs> but there is we have enough space to coordinate both group pools for people who the the privateness of the pool is not particularly important and shared pools where you get private time in a pool that would be like the ecological luxury the, the circulating access to pools scenario right, right, right. means that you can have a sustainable reasonable amount of pools where people have access to that swimming without requiring everyone to literally build their own personal pool in their backyard which would take up a lot of space and it would go a lot of pools would go unused for very long periods of time presumably if you had 8 billion pools on this planet yeah because sharing things sharing pools sharing all kinds of things brings about more access to those things it is a luxury it's a luxury to have libraries in our current society it's a luxury to be able to go and take out any book that your library has and read it and not have to pay and then someone else can take it out and read it. That's like... It's an ecological luxury, the library, because you're sharing something, you're using less materials, and it's a place where there's the synergy. So if there's pools that are available to... Obviously, you can't take a pool out and bring it home with you, but you can take time at the pool or use the pool in the same way that you can use the book, uh, and then other people can use it after you. That's a type of luxury. And like that principle of like producing fewer things and allowing more people to have access to it that libraries have or that shared community spaces like pools have is one of those areas where ecology and luxury like deeply overlap because the more we share things the more access to different things different nice things different comfortable things different luxurious things that we can all have so the more as a society we have commonly held shared property managed in a way similar to a lending library, the more access to luxury we all have, like inherently, while producing less, but getting more from it. Yeah. So the library economy, the dynamics of library economy, like use of fructi and lending, like the lending library, we talk about in uh, some of our other episodes on library socialism. It's, it's a place where you have that ecological luxury synthesis really, really effectively because the material objects that we furnish our life with, we can have more access to them with less ecological offense if we share them. And I think also kind of implicit to the library economy is full recycling which is the premise that everything that gets thrown out is used in some way. There's no longer dumps where garbage piles up indefinitely. And not only that, we're going to go into the dumps and we're going to pull out the usable material from it and use it. So we're going to achieve a negative total sum of garbage is one of the goals of an ecologically luxurious society. We can go further by setting up full repair, which is setting up institutions that can repair things that have broken down where there's specialization, where people can get training to participate in the building and rebuilding of the material objects that we all share to make sure we get maximum use out of it and make minimum ecological impact from it. Part of what that implies is changes also in manufacturing processes towards the prevention of things that are being made just to break down quickly, things that are built to last that are actually usable and so on. Things like modularity, have things be designed that items can be broken down into smaller parts and those parts can be subbed out more easily. 
You could also have types of modularity that are aimed at general accessibility, like aimed towards people who are less familiar with the technology or people who are younger, et cetera. And another luxury to this sort of system, and this isn't for everyone, it's not uh, mandatory, but the option to be able to learn how the things around you work in greater detail and have people help you to take them apart and put them together where it's not warranty voiding or something like that to open up your own phone and understand how it works and sub out parts over time and recycled and repaired and so on. That's a world that I want to live in, a world where I can get my hands on the insides of more of the things that I work with and understand it better and have kind of a culture of doing that. Yeah, because if we repair things, if we build things to last in the first place through production processes engineered to be as ecological as possible, engineering things to last as long as possible and be repaired as easily as possible, again, that reduces the amount of production that we have to do. And the reducing the amount of production that we have to do reduces the amount of energy that we need to use to produce things. And then sharing those things that are really sturdily built to last for a really, really long time further reduces the need to produce a certain amount of those things. Because you only need to produce one book for 100 people to read at a library versus 100 books. Like you it's a massive reduction in the amount of production to share things uh, and to build them to last for a long time. So that's a place where ecology and luxury are not only like not opposed to each other, but like actively synthesizing one another. This idea of like building ecology into production along every step and building things to last as long as possible and thereby reducing the amount of production is luxurious for people to have access to a system like that. And it is ecological. It's not even balancing the two of those. It's like more of one is more of the other. They're like not on two opposite ends of a spectrum. They're in the same direction as one another, as opposed to an ecological disaster on the other end. Yeah. So in ecological luxury, there's the things that happen to be both luxurious and ecological, but then there's also this subcategory of things where there's this intense synergy between ecology and luxury, where the luxury is enabled and structurally constituted from an ecological context. Another one of these is time off of work, having a three-day work week, 20-hour work week, Reducing the amount of time that people are spending at work is a luxury that is itself inherently ecological. It's luxurious to people's day-to-day -day lives if you're getting paid the same amount and having to work less. So how do you reduce work hours? Well, the, the fully automated luxury communists would say use robots and automation to reduce work hours. And I think that's part of it to a certain degree. And the degrowth people would say, slow down the amount of work that you do overall. There's no reason to break our necks, hyper producing all the time. We produce too much and we use too little, like let's have a more reasonable pace. That's also partially true. Yeah. Both of those things combined with sharing the things we build and building things to last as long as possible allows people to work less, which is, as you say, in and of itself a luxury, like having more time to spend on things you care about. Uh, hobbies, more time to spend with your family, your friends, uh, doing things you enjoy, relaxing at the beach, writing your novel, playing games, playing sports, building things, learning new skills. There's like so many things that you could be doing that it would be a luxury in our current society to have the time to do. So reducing work hours in and of itself is a luxury. And it also has ecological side effects of like, you know, the fewer office lights you have on, the fewer people commuting to the office, the better in terms of energy usage in a society. And for ecology's sake, we want to get energy use down to a level to where we can sustainably produce as much as we need to meet the demand. And part of that is like, you know, how, how much can we produce sustainably? And part of that is how much can we reduce energy use? There are a lot of jobs in our current society that don't need to be done or wouldn't need to be done in the type of society that we're talking about. Uh, like, you know, all the people who spend their lives coding DRM in order to prevent people from sharing files wouldn't be necessary in a society where all files are able to be freely shared, where art and music and books and television and research papers and things are all freely available to people. You don't need to waste all this man hours on this arms war of like people trying to get around copyright protection software and the people building up the software to cover the bugs and like this, like it's all this wasted energy being spent on bullshit jobs. 
can go back and listen to our episode with David Graber about that kind of thing. Uh, there's like people whose job it is to drive to the insurance office 30 minutes both ways in their gasoline powered car to sit in an office with the lights on denying people's medical insurance claims. Like that's your job. In a society where people are provided with the medical care they need, that job doesn't need to exist. There's people whose entire job it is to walk around beside Elon Musk and tell him he has great ideas and he's doing the best things you know, and to like do his every little whim. That's another job that doesn't need to exist. There's a lot of jobs in our society that don't need to exist. In the original Buckminster Fuller quote, when he says, we can achieve this thing, better standard of living, less ecological offense. If I recall correctly, he continues to say, we need to move from building something like we need to move from building weaponry to livingry. Right. So yeah, he, I think he, I've heard that. Yeah. So he's critiquing the military industrial complex and the idea that we should spend all this money on more. Like talk about talking yeah, about bullshit waste. jobs. Yeah. Imagine your job is to train all the time to eventually kill your neighbors. Uh, how sad is that? Destroy infrastructure that just needs to be built again. Uh, and we're going to spend millions and millions of dollars in new and more efficient killing machines to indiscriminately kill people in the radius of bad guys. And those people walk away for life with incredible trauma, haunted, haunted by what they've done, if they survive at all. This is mind boggling. It's tragic in itself. Like yeah. it's and it's also just like if you want to talk about something that is in the opposite direction of both luxury and ecology. It is literally the opposite of ecological luxury. That's why it was funny when what was it? Elizabeth Warren said something about greening the military. It's actually, I mean, if you're gonna keep the military, you obviously need to green the military. So it's true in a sense. <laughs> like yeah, uh, in a way but, it's better if the tank runs on electricity than gas, but, I guess. Like But I mean, the military is just a, a an engine of ecological logical devastation it is an absolute yeah. planet wrecking thing it is you're destroying usable shit like you're just constantly destroying shit which then requires it to be rebuilt yeah there's ecological devastation well, like, nuclear bombs haven't been dropped many times in human history thank god it's horrible environmental fallout from those but even just like weapons manufacturing uh destroying both human built infrastructure and like the natural world surrounding these places like you know there's like you could go on and on about the ecological costs of war and i don't think anyone would argue that war is like a luxurious thing to experience on any side so yeah yeah i mean the psychologically devastating impacts of war not just for the innocent civilians and bystanders i mean even just people who see it from afar are affected by war but the people who perpetrate war live with that for life psychologically that is an un that is an incredible misuse of human resources unbelievable shit devastating tragic nightmarish really so yeah we'd want to ecological luxury would necessitate a global peace movement as well absolutely yeah it's another area where those two things like really overlap today's episode of seriously wrong is brought to you by Total recirculation, full repair, and complete recycling. In order to have an ecological society, advanced recycling will need to overtake garbage in our lives. And trash pickup will need to be eliminated in favor of a system that recycles, recirculates, and repairs everything to the highest degree possible. In a library society, municipal waste systems and municipal library systems are integrated in a way where you can leave your library returns and donations on the side of the curb on a certain day of the week, like a recycling bin, and it will make its way back to the library. Any item you no longer use will either be reused, repaired by specialists, or broken down into component parts that can be made into something new. Manufacturing will be improved with an emphasis on longevity, modularity, interoperability, and repairability over obsolescence and waste. Glass, iron, aluminum, copper, lithium, and other metals are infinitely recyclable. There are abundant stores of recyclable metals and landfills which can be rescued as part of a mandate of an extended waste management program. Over time we can reduce both the new materials going into landfills down to zero and at the same time rescue useful materials from landfills, shrinking them to ensure a high material standard of living for all. Both domestic, small-scale, and municipal, large-scale composting can take food waste and turn it into useful fertilizer. That fertilizer can be used to grow food in municipal food forests. A library socialist system of complete repair and recycling can provide a higher level of luxury to all. 
while greatly reducing environmental costs, giving us more freedom and more ecologically luxurious lives. Total recirculation, full repair, and complete recycling. Proud sponsor of today's episode of Seriously Wrong. Uh, excuse me, hi, uh, human resources? I'd like to file a complaint. Oh, come in. My boss made an insulting comment. Come in, close the door. I'm so sorry this happened to you. What happened? Tell me the whole story. Well, uh, sorry, this is... This makes me upset to think about, but... Absolutely. Do you want water? Please. With a slice of lemon, that's perfect. Thank you. So, today I showed up for my shift late, five hours late. Mm-hmm. And when I explained that it was because I had stayed up too late last night playing video games, I was having a lot of fun with some of my friends playing online video games. We didn't go to bed until the sun was coming up. And I explained all this to the boss. And when I did, he said, try to get to bed earlier next time. Oh. And, it, and it, wasn't, it wasn't even, it didn't feel like a genuine suggestion. It feels aggressive. Yeah, it was aggressive. Like it had a bit of a tone on it. Yeah. Well, I'm so sorry. Well, first, on behalf of the organization, I just want to say that doesn't represent our values here. Thank you. Your contract very clearly allows for 10 sleepy days where you can show up as late as you want because you are too tired and you want to sleep in. And let me guess, you use less than 10 this year? This was only my fifth. Okay, well, I've heard enough. I'm so sorry you had to go through that here. Again, that is not what we do here. That's not the values of our firm or our society more generally. I'd been saving up my sleepy days all year. You have that right. You know, I was just really looking forward to using them, and now I just feel it's awkward about it and like, oh, can I use them? Am I going to get more comments? I'm going to put in a formal complaint about this. He'll get a warning. It won't be a serious punishment, but he'll know not to do it in the future. And is it a new video game or is it one that you've been playing a long time? Oh, a new one. Okay, well, that makes sense. I mean, you need to explain that to him? I couldn't even get that far because I could already tell he wasn't interested in my full explanation of which video games it was and why they were important to me. Oh, uh, wow. I think you should just go home for the day. We'll pay you up for the day and you can heal from this because that was just, it was out of line. And thank you. That sort yeah. of aggression, even a small aggression like that, can foster resentments in the workplace. And we want you doing your best. We'll, yeah. we'll have a talk with him. Thanks for sharing. You go home. Go thank home. you so much, human resources. You're truly on my side. There are certain things that are luxurious that would only be available in an ecological society. Uh, ecology itself is a type of luxury, like living in a ecologically harmonious society would feel like a luxury and is a type of luxury compared to living in a society that's like destroying the biosphere. That's like, it would be way more comfortable. It would be way more like sort of that feeling of being like wrapped up in something nice and cocoony, this luxurious, like you're in like a plush bed or something of an ecology that is healthy across the planet. I feel like that's in and of itself a luxurious thing. That part of your brain right now that's like worried about the future, that's worried about the climate and so on. Under our system, we would all have the luxury of not having to worry about that, knowing that there are competent people who are looking at that, being able to look at that information, see what's going on and see like, no, we, we're living within the boundaries of this planet. I don't need to worry that the future is going to be some sort of dystopia for my children. It's one of those things that shouldn't be a luxury, but unfortunately is to all 8 billion of us, even the most powerful among us live in fear of this uh, for good reason. And I find that area really interesting where the ecology itself is the source of luxury. And that general existential dread isn't the only part. I mean, biodiversity in general contributes to so many forms of luxury, like the luxury of spending time in nature, the luxury of being able to observe and know about wild animals, again, not having to worry about them. But also biodiversity connects to cuisine and the ability to make great recipes. For example, you have a wider variety of types of potatoes, you have a wider variety of types of potato recipes, and therefore a wider variety of luxurious cuisines to try and recipes to make and so on. Yeah, biodiversity also benefits medical research, having different compounds found in different plants. Yeah, what if we accidentally made the cure for cancer go extinct before we found it? 
textiles also it's another way biodiversity is a type of luxury different fabrics right yeah luxurious different types of fabrics there could even be types of fabrics that are better than our wildest dreams we're yet to discover don't want to risk letting the greatest fabric of all time go extinct by being careless uh, there's also like building materials biodiversity creates different opportunities for to make building materials or even like craft materials or uh, paints and artistry sort of things even musical instruments things like shells are turned into musical instruments or like bamboo or reeds could be turned into flutes and so on so there's all these different layers to the way that biodiversity contributes to luxury. I think it's safe to say that the loss of biodiversity is the greatest loss of luxury in history. And if we care about luxury, if we're fully automated luxury communists, then we need to care deeply about the loss of luxury in nature. But also just like the experience of nature is a type of luxury. Like people talk about like, you know, being able to have time or like a vehicle to drive to a public park in North America is like a type of luxury. And I think part of the vision of ecological luxury is redesigning cities to be more ecological. And part of redesigning cities to be more ecological is to increase the biodiversity within cities, more green space, more different plants, flora and fauna. We've talked before on the show about how horrible car culture is for the ecology and for the experience. The amount of luxuriousness of the experience of living in a city is like devastated by roads and cars being such a massive part of the footprint of all of our cities. Yeah. Under ecological luxury, there's going to be a beautiful day where the people rise up against the roads on behalf of the animals and the plants, take the pickaxes out and just, just rip Absolutely. those bad boys out and just... <laughs> Maybe you can leave a strip for, you know, golf carts and like accessibility concern. We want people to be able to get around. Obviously, there'll be public transport, green train subway systems that allow people to get around cities. But yeah, turning our cities into parks, building more housing on those space where those roads are with paths in between it. We talked about whether everyone can have a backyard. The whole city can be your backyard. It's like not just like a crappy lawn that you have to like water. It's it's a well-managed ecology. Every single city is. So there's like plants that are native to the area that grow well. It depends you know that, where you are. That but. feeling of like leaving the city or whatever and like going into a wooded area where you can no longer see the buildings or the road just for a little while and being surrounded by the trees that tower above your heads and the mushrooms and the grasses around you. You maybe see an animal walk by and that feeling inside of like a psychological stilling of anxiety, the sense of presence and connection. It's like a pretty universal experience, right? And like there's positive yeah. psychological effects to spending time in nature and stuff. It's uncontroversial stuff. Yeah. That feeling is a feeling that we should strive to be sort of like an ambient, regular, everyday feeling that like between your dentist appointment and going to meet your friends to get French fries that are just as good, but uh, are, <laughs> healthy for you. are healthy for you as well, which we'll get into soon. <laughs> <laughs> it's another one of our promises. <laughs> no, you're going you're going to meet your friends for food and you're leaving the dentist's office and in between you're going to have paths available to you that are embedded in sort of nature. That is an ecological luxury. But also we need to be able to make the promise or set the goal and I think the fully automated luxury communists are right about this is like what technological counter solutions can we pose for car culture that we can make that argument that we're going to be better than cars. Like you're going to have better transportation options. So like individual carts that allow you to move through different environments. There's, there's also like personal public transit. It's an idea that's been floated before. It's kind of like between cars and buses. So you get the convenience of the individual movement, but, and that's something to be integrated in an overall transit system that allows people to get around, but also designing communities where there isn't necessarily always the requirement to be constantly traveling very far from your community. I think th th this would be kind of a degrowth perspective is that if you have everything you need within a certain area, if everyone has what they need within a certain area, like a walkable community or 
equivalent, you know, 15 minutes or whatever, then there's less of a requirement to have constant numerous forms of transportation. Um, people can adjust. The degrowth perspective is that people could adjust their life to the ecological boundaries. The fully automated luxury communist perspective would be like, we can make better ecologically sound public transit that includes cars with new types of technology and be better cars than cars ever were. And again, I actually think that both sides are kind of right. Like we can, we can do both those things. Yeah. There's no contradiction between reducing the need to transport yourself across the city by like generally having everything people need within 15 minute radiuses to also like having easy transport. If you do need to go downtown or whatever the equivalent of a downtown, say there's a concert in the area, they're not going to have one in every 15 minute area of the city. You know, they have like 30 concerts around Vancouver. So there's just one concert. It's easy to hop on the train and go downtown, see the game or the concert or the whatever. You can have both of those things be part of a strategy for how transport could work within cities. But yeah, I think, yeah, crucially, another point about having cities being more filled with nature is not just that it's luxurious to experience nature, to turn cities into a type of park. That's a luxurious experience. It's part of ecological luxury, but it is also crucially very good for the ecology, not just to remove cars. We talked about the removing cars aspect of it, but increasing the biomass of the planet, having more plants and animals existing on the planet takes carbon out of the atmosphere. This is the same principle behind rewilding, which is that if you build up a whole bunch of trees and plants and animals and like the leaves fall on the ground and become part of the topsoil, having more biomass on the planet inside of our cities and outside of our cities through rewilding campaigns is a deeply ecological thing that, you know, arguably is necessary in order to prevent climate change. That is also like, it's a type of luxury to have more nature, both in your immediate environment for that experience, uh, but also on the planet overall. Yeah. The more of the planet's surface that is used by humans for, you know, agriculture, cities, roads, etc., the worse off for biodiversity. The more space that we give to wild nature, I can't remember the exact calculation, but there's just, it's like a direct ratio. This much land equals this much biodiversity remaining. This right. much land equals this smaller amount remaining and so on. So the more you have, the better. So yeah, having- both in terms of biodiversity and carbon. Yeah, exactly. And then on top of all of that, we have the luxury of having even better animal documentaries, uh, even more. <laughs> and I don't know, I find a lot of people that I talk to about rewilding intuitively feel like, yeah, I love the idea of more plants and animals. That's great. I've heard that we haven't been dealing with that so well my entire life since I was a child. Like maybe it's time to start dealing with that well. It'd be such a what, a, what a wonderful luxury to not only have more larger parks and access to nature in your day-to-day -day life, but to know in the background that far away, there's enormous parks, enormous places with a lot of nature where, you know, where nature can just be nature. <laughs> Yeah. Like you said, since we were kids, we've been like in this world of cutting down the Amazon jungle, like logging, like just being like nature being like reduced and reduced and eliminated and destroyed and bulldozers running through the forest and scooping up all the trees and the poor little foxes and <laughs> deer and whatever else and just shoving it all into like a, a wood chipper. And, and we just show up there, wrong boys show up there and put our hands up. <laughs> We're like, in the name of ecological luxury, put but, down your tools. But like, and all the is. workers are like, wait, it's actually in our best interests. And they like start taking apart the machinery and they... It's it's kind of like that same like mental luxury we we're talking about, about climate change of like seeing it go in the opposite direction. Like, I don't know if I believe that there will be a point in my life where I'm seeing it like really going in the opposite direction. I'm just like, oh, that would be like, what a beautiful thing, like seeing more and more of the world rewilding that like feeling of like, okay, God, we're moving in the right direction on this thing. Maybe we aren't even like fully there yet in terms of like carbon emissions being where they need to be or the levels in the atmosphere or the amount of biodiversity getting back to what it once was, but to like, oh yeah, we're doing like as a society, we're moving in the right direction on that thing. 
That would be a luxury. I don't care who you are. That's a damn luxury. <laughs> that would that would be as good to me as you know a fine glass of champagne or like a. It'd be even better than a diamond bracelet. You know, <laughs> I'm no, trying to think absolutely. what are some like luxurious things. I would never go on a yacht my whole life if it meant that I could have that. I would be I would be fine. Just you know. You hear that? Aaron's going to give up his yacht time. That means he's serious. <laughs> I would also never go on a yacht. <laughs> Let's do it. Oh, we're all taking this big sacrifice together, guys. <laughs> but just in terms of ranking luxuries, is where I was going with it. That seems better to me than a yacht. It seems better to me than a diamond bracelet. Imagine you're like, you know, an heiress and you come down the stairs in your billowing dress and your billionaire husband is there and he says, darling, I've gotten you something for your anniversary. She's like, oh, pray tell. What did you get me, my dear beloved? A third necklace to put on my drooling crusted says, neck? No, 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 silly, silly. <laughs> Not a mere necklace. I reversed climate change and biodiversity loss, darling. It We're started tonight. in the other direction now. <laughs> I've gotten all the governments of the world on board using my uh, wealth and influence. The amount of garbage that's currently in dumps is going to be reducing over time from now now on, darling. Yeah. I mean, if I'm the wife of that billionaire investor, that's the greatest gift you could ever give me. Oh, That'd absolutely. Be, yeah. Yeah. I'd be overjoyed if someone I, I got that for me. I would the biggest kiss on you for our anniversary for that. If that was our present, my present. How flattered would you be if someone did that for you? Oh, yeah. That's just you brings did another, that for me? An, <laughs> it brings another layer to it. You know, it's good in itself. And it's just if it happened, if someone else got it, I wouldn't. Maybe I'd be a little jealous, actually. I'd be like, oh, what did she do to deserve that? <laughs> a great gift. <laughs> I'm out here grinding on my podcast. No one's, no one's, buy, no one's getting me, me. By the reversal of historic trends on climate. But I mean, it is kind of the benefit of reversing the historic trends on climate is that it's a gift to your significant other, yes, but it's also a gift to the world. Like that hypothetical billionaire who did that uh, did kind of give it to you in a way. Not for your anniversary with him. It's true. But he doesn't care about me like that. No, but yeah. Point being, it's luxurious. Don't want to hear anybody saying ecology and luxury are inherently opposed again after that example. That just proved it. Yeah, no, it's bulletproof. This episode of Seriously Wrong is brought to you by the full integration of the ecosystem into the city with symbiotic relationships between humankind, flora, fauna, and fungi. Cities are complex ecosystems, and it's time we started treating them that way. Urban planning needs to take into account not just the needs of humans, but the needs of all the plant and animal life integrated into the city, and the ways in which the city ecosystem interacts and integrates with surrounding ecosystems. Plant life can be integrated into the city in ways that are useful to people through the expansion of urban green space ecosystems, including food forests. Also, hemp, azolla, and other carbon sequestering plants can be integrated in urban gardens and grown for nutrition, biofuel, green manure, phytoremediation, conversion to biochar, or use in fabrication, crafting, and building materials. Some mushrooms, including edible mushrooms, can digest plastic and transform it back into usable material. The process of composting can be helped along with the use of bugs like black soldier flies, which also produce easily harvestable larvae that can be fed to domestic and farm animals. Goats are a very beneficial livestock for urban ecosystems and human use. Municipal goat herds could be fed that harvested larva and used for soil enrichment, landscape management, and to transform waste materials into usable materials like wool, manure, fertilizer, and dairy products. Goat digestion is particularly efficient at producing high quality fertilizer. Pigeon towers are honeycomb-like structures that can provide places for pigeons to congregate within cities, reducing their status as a pest and making it easy to harvest their valuable guano. City pigeons often eat food scraps that make them ill, resulting in droppings that can spread disease. But pigeon towers can provide high quality nutrition to local pigeons, and their congregated droppings can be shoveled and used as a high quality fertilizer. In many areas, pest control for mosquitoes could be handled by a symbiotic relationship with bats housed in municipal bat houses, which can also be a good source of fertilizer guano. 
Streams and lakes can be managed to nourish diverse and healthy animal ecosystems, including aquatic food forests for human use. Aquaponic systems can also create synergistic loops between fish and human agriculture, benefiting both in the process. Municipal urban fish ponds can also be part of urban wastewater systems, using algae and phytoplankton to break down human waste and create oxygen-rich water for the raising of fish. Rewilding outside of the city can have benefits within the city. Species that have been pushed out of human-used areas, including carnivores like wolves and grazing megafauna like bison, can be reintroduced to support biodiversity and strong eco-communities. Protected corridors for these animals to travel unimpeded can allow specialists to monitor and care for wild populations. In cities, protected corridors and other animal-centric infrastructure for local birds, raccoons, mice, and other wild animals can protect humans and animals from one another while monitoring and protecting the species that make up the ecosystem. Increasing animal and plant biomass sequesters carbon both within the living plants and animals themselves during their life cycle, because they're made of carbon, but also within the rebuilt topsoil that comes from reversing erosion and creating a thriving ecosystem both above and below the surface of the earth. Urban food forest ecosystems can be sustained in domed greenhouses to provide year-round public parks and even the growth of tropical fruits like pineapples and bananas. By integrating flora, fauna, and fungi consciously into our municipal ecosystems, we can have richer, more beautiful, and more luxurious ecological lives. The full integration of the ecosystem into the city, with symbiotic relationships between humankind, flora, fauna, and fungi. Proud sponsor of Seriously Wrong. And I think there's a sort of contradiction that people don't recognize in the more traditional definition of luxury. You know, some of the objections you get to saying fully automated luxury communism or we should have a society with luxury is the idea that luxuries are by definition exclusive. They're things that some people get that other people don't get. And if everybody gets it, then it's not a luxury anymore by definition. Uh, and, you know, if that's how someone chooses to define the word luxury that you know that's fine i'm not i can't change people's personal definitions but if luxury is defined as like a comfort that is based on exclusivity then there's always like a aspect of non-comfort contained within that because if you're in a society even if you're the richest person in our society like we mentioned how rich people can't escape the fear of climate change having to amass great amounts of wealth in the society means having to fear it being taken away it means having to hire people to protect it often means having to hire people to protect you so it's a fairly common thing rich people have to walk around with bodyguards to have comforts in this society that are defined as luxuries is to constantly be in a state of anxiety and fear about them being taken away or losing them somehow. And that in and of itself sort of undermines the comfort. So the idea that luxuries should be defined as exclusive to me doesn't make any sense because like a true luxury is a luxury is a comfort that is shared by all, a comfort that we can all expect no matter what. Whatever happens, these are things that are guaranteed within the society. That's a true luxury. That's like a deep luxury. That's like a luxury that really exists in a way that more exclusive luxuries don't. Yeah, I think people can probably understand intuitively why a global library of things, full recycling and repair, reduce in work hours, focus on biodiversity, meeting our limits and so on, benefits regular people who struggle and suffer and spend their time waiting for the work week to be over for escapism and so on, like the people who aren't making zillions of dollars and buying each other world historical transformations as <laughs> anniversary gifts. But we did say that we were going to make things better for everyone. And maybe using that extreme example, we could give a few other quick examples of how this global transformation to library socialism and ecological luxury would benefit even the most powerful and wealthy amongst us, because they are such a potent example. They're the place where it's demonstrated that this system ultimately fails everyone. And the example of the peace of mind about biodiversity in the environment is a great example. Another great example is how a global digital library makes people richer than rich in the sense that 
even the richest person's library under the current system isn't as good as everyone on earth working together to digitize and scan and create a global complete library in all languages, all translations, all commentaries, all hyperlinked and connected to each other in a space where everyone can have access to it for free, you know, with the library card being human, you know, going on the internet. Yeah, no dogs that, allowed, but humans only. No matter how rich you are, you can't access media that's not available to buy because it's, you know, it's in some rights limbo or it's, I mean, maybe you, you probably could find a copy of it actually depend if it's like truly lost media, then no, but yeah, there would be less truly lost media. But there would also be a bunch of new media as well, because of people having access to this repository of global ideas and have being able to experience different genres of the things that, that they are artists of themselves, it can deepen their practice and increase the amount of people producing great works because they have access to the global canon. Yeah. So that's another way that even the the rich and powerful are richer than rich under our proposed ecological luxury system, because they will get to experience art and writing and media and so on that would never otherwise exist if the people who made them didn't have access to the library. They won't require, they won't need as much storage. They'll be able to access many or all of the same things they can access now, but without the requirement for huge amounts of storage. And maybe that's a minor thing, but I find property really burdensome, like dragging around my boxes when I move and stuff. I always, right. I just get in this incredible mood of, <laughs> just loathing the concept of private property. I can only imagine what it's like when it's on an even larger scale, but I guess they get little servant slave boys to do that kind of thing for them. Right. Yeah. But, but even that, like in a ecological luxury society, you wouldn't have to hire servants who like surround yourself with people who kind of like resent you because you're this rich asshole who's like paying them to clean their house yeah. or whatever. Like rich, rich people can get real friends more often under library right, socialism. Right, right, not just people trying to game them to get something from them who is like... Or obscuring what they really think because it's going to... Yeah. They're worried about their, their family being able to family. afford yeah. payments on the car. Yeah, it would be like... What a luxury to have like a true social connection with another human being that would be like really probably rare for like those highest elite people. Like Elon Musk... I don't know, like maybe he has someone who's like a real friend who is fully honest with it, you know, like who he can talk to about stuff. But I don't know. I, be, I think it would be hard for him to find that. It's, maybe it's weird making it personal, a, a single individual. But <laughs> I'm just contemplating whether Elon Musk has friends. But yeah, no, it's hard to. What without... if he can make a friend even? Like if he doesn't have them already, I don't know if he can make one right now. Like maybe another billionaire. Yeah, I mean, it's clear, though, that under this system, whether Elon has sincere real friends or not, and I hope for his sake he does, but I can't imagine. It's hard to... Yeah. I assume he, he might... Okay, but here, anyways, the but probably... But there's always this thing underneath it, right? This is the existential horror of capitalism for the successful. It's like when he cracks his meme jokes, he can't be certain that the people around him are actually laughing at the joke or right. are subservient toads who are trying to get a taste at the slop bowl so they can afford their car payments. <laughs> and in the soul of the rich man, in the soul of Elon Musk, he craves the connection of knowing that the people are really laughing at him. Right. And that dissonance is existentially horrifying you know if you're planning in your life you imagine yourself getting very rich and powerful isn't that terrifying that you could start being surrounded by like shadow friends <laughs> like <laughs> yeah no but i think there is genuinely something there like liberating for the rich and powerful to move instead to a uh, a fair system Mr. Spenceworth, sir, on line two, we have Mr. Bysworth, who's tied for richest man in Wrongtown. I think he wants to menacingly debate your ongoing rivalry. Yes, yes. Thank you, phone servant. Hello, Bysworth. How's your market-based solutions to climate change looking? Last graphs from the scientists looking pretty dismal. <laughs> Spenceworth? Your programs of voluntary corporate responsibility and awareness raising aren't doing well either. The graphs are just as much your doing as mine. Bysworth, we've been way ahead of you on green initiatives from the start. The paper towels in all of my businesses are made from 100% recycled materials. 
And our idea for paper straws is working wonderfully. Spensworth, I led the fight for paper straws. Don't you dare take credit for that, Spensworth. I invented paper straws and the lid stays plastic. That was my idea. Well, we invented the coating that makes it so the paper straws sometimes don't stick to your lips. Spensworth. Spensworth. I buy so many carbon credits, you low-born, fossil-fuel-loving dog. Well, that's nothing compared to my green public-private partnership money. This green <laughs> capitalism stuff is going to make me a lot of money because I'm in on the ground floor. <laughs> Bysworth, I invested on the ground floor and I'm going to be rich. You know I'm looking for even more esoteric ways to financialize nature into markets. Oh, Bysworth. I donated $250,000 to planting monocrops for carbon capture. That's nothing. I donated $1 million to greening the military. Mm, Spensworth. <laughs> I'm going to do solar radiation management via particulate sprays in the atmosphere before you and your cronies get to oh, it. Oh, are and you? And then I'll watch it from my privately owned spaceship. <laughs> now, well, my private space firm will be on Jupiter's exotic moons by then, living happy lives with our alien wives. Bysworth. Oh, fat chance, Spensworth. They'll be able to stand you. When the climate crisis inevitably does reach its breaking point, I'll have the most advanced bunker, full weatherization, vast solar arrays, decades of foodstuffs, badminton court, TV on DVD. Your bunker may be bigger than mine, but my servant bunker casts will never rise up against me, unlike your dumbass, because I give them extended benefits. Oh, yeah, will they? <laughs> yeah, they will. You'll rise up on you. As if you can truly protect just yourself from climate change, Bysworth. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. You're still ultimately doomed, even if your bunker servants do not rise up, which I highly doubt. Uh, no, Spensworth. You are the one who is ultimately doomed. Even your exclusive green lifestyle, private waterfalls and electric cars has the, the seed of this discomforting, unluxurious, ecological reality. Oh, I suppose you're right, Bysworth. No matter how much we try to isolate ourselves individually from the effects of climate change, I guess ending up here in a bunker is a horrific type of doom in and of itself. <sighs> ah, that's right, Spensworth. Even now we're lonely and alienated, resigned to the inevitable death of people around us, just trying to protect ourselves and our families. Our knowledge about justice has to be actively suppressed just to have a basic level of comfort. It's a profound spiritual violence, Spensworth. Oh, I have a whole solar heated swimming pool out back, but nobody to swim in it with me. You know, it's almost as if luxury should be universal and ecological, or it can't be luxury at all. Sometimes I think those damn Yusufructian library socialists might be right. It can't just be for some. Their confederation of helpers is so helpful. Oh, but the luxury ecological library socialist movement want to take away our swimming pools and fleets of electric trucks and private waterfalls. Our multi-deck yachts, they want to take our wardrobes, our collections of shoes, our, uh, our garages full of... It's <laughs> my property. They want to take it. No, my they want having. They my havings. They're part of my And they can't have it. They can't. They can't have it. Ours, we own it. They can't have it. No, mine, mine, own mine, it. Ours. Property. Not yours. It's not yours. Oh, I am getting a call from my adult son. Sorry, I've got to go. But screw you, oh, you Spensworth. Go, All right, yeah. Running away again. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a son. Yo, Dad, you got a minute to talk? Little Billy Bysworth, how are you doing? Oh, you know. Pleasure to hear from you. It's a, you don't call enough. I know, Dad. Yeah, I know. I just, I was on safari here in Africa. Beautiful country this time of year. Right? But for some reason, nobody told me it wasn't giraffe hunting season, and I shot multiple giraffes. Oh, and innocent mistake. Good kid. The locals got upset, and I just, I'm going to need your help to bail me out. You put me in contact with them. We'll, we'll get this settled up. It's an innocent mistake. It's been escalated into the federal court because it, there's other charges. I had all this oil we were transporting and it just I dumped it in what I thought was just like a trash can or something but it turned out to be the spawning ground of some endangered species or something I can't remember but the oil was just really heavy we had to get rid of it oh I'm so sorry to hear about the heaviness of that oil boy I've always tried to protect you from things like that oh thanks pop say There's no more thing too. say no more oh do tell how was I supposed to know you're not supposed to use Molotov cocktails for hunting in dry season? It started a little bit of a jungle fire, forest fire situation. Right. It spread to some 
nearby villages. It was kind of ecological humanitarian disaster. I think the headlines are probably going to be about the orangutans who burned alive, but uh, many people did lose their homes. Oh, my Billy boy. Well, we'll get the whole spin team on this, and I'll pay overtime for it, and we're going to get you out of this pickle. It's an innocent mistake. You know, it could have happened to anyone. I'm listening to this story, I'm thinking, there but by the grace of God go I. We all make mistakes, and we work to improve them, but I don't want to dogpile you right now. You're going through so much. The prison cell here, the bed is really hard, and the food oh. sucks, and... Everyone keeps looking at me like I'm like an asshole or something. I just, I know, if you That's could unfair. Just That's unfair. Me, They're criminals as well. Can you help me out with this one, Pop? Of course, of sweet, course. Sweet Pop, get me moved into a nice hotel or something. Absolutely. No, we'll do the Thank calls. You. We'll take a series of calls. And Thank you. It will all be very cleared up. And those criminals, we'll make sure they're punished even further for judging you. You're the best. Well, I just couldn't feel good about myself if I let my son rot in a jail cell for a series of escalating innocent mistakes it sounds like you've been through enough yeah this is a matter of conscience for me boy so i'll work on this a lot and very quickly but i have to go all right bye i'm so proud of you son love you So I think one of the main, if not the main, real disagreements between like a degrowth utopian and a fully automated luxury communist utopian is energy capacity. Can we find ways to have this highly automated utopian system? Do we have the energy for all this high tech stuff or do we need to scale back on technology? You know, maybe not even because it's wrong, but just because it's just we can't like we don't have we have to stop using fossil fuels and the other stuff isn't there and maybe never will be. <laughs> I feel like that's kind of the, like a, the energy concern. Yeah. So I, I think there is a, in the broad sort of like degrowth, ecological leftism, like the half earth socialism guys that we talked to earlier this season, they were talking about like energy budgets as a potential aspect of their Marxist utopia. Right. And that's, that's based on their analysis that I think is correct in the current moment is like, we don't have an energy pathway to keep on expanding and expanding perpetually all the different technological energy uses that we're using year after year. And that part of the solution has to be in the short term, withdrawing the amount of energy that we're using to a sustainable level. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I, I think I'm more techno optimist than a lot of degrowth people are. But if when rubber is meeting the road in terms of the realms of actual politics, scaling back tech to me takes precedent. We need to get the carbon output to a place where it's sustainable. That's the most important. And the, the only feasible way I can see to doing that is decreasing the energy that we're using right now, uh, especially in certain parts of the world. I want to push back in a friendly way on just the wording of a particular thing you said, which is the scaling down of technology. The the argument, I think, is that there's certain high energy technologies that they're not feasible in the short term. So therefore, technological capacity should be looking at low energy alternatives. I think it's better understood as pivoting technology towards ends that are lower energy and that can meet our needs. Yeah, I think the synthesis of these high energy and low energy perspectives is that the current moment is a scenario where we need to decrease energy in relation to fossil fuels in particular. Fossil fuels make up a lot of the energy we use, so we need to be using less energy overall in order to phase out fossil fuels in particular in the time frame that we need to. Yeah, it's just the infrastructure we currently have is like vast, like there's so much fossil fuel infrastructure that exists, like part of me is still like, yeah, we can just like expand solar panels, expand wind, geothermal, all these things and like cover it all, you know, maybe in relatively quick, if we did a Manhattan project level type thing, 10 years, we'll all be living Canadian energy budget lifestyles. Uh, There's like a techno optimist part of me that believes that I I couldn't like argue that in terms of numbers. It's more like a, yeah, technology will just keep getting better thing. But I do believe that it will be possible because energy technology does keep getting better. I just don't think even optimistically, like changing it all over to like batteries and solar has like all these other problems of 
energy going to produce those things and the materials needed to produce those things. I just don't think, especially with the economic system and the political system we currently have, that it's going to be possible to fully shift over to that without doing a huge amount of damage to the environment. That's the hand that we're dealt in the short term. And I think I have I've heard no refutation of this that, that is in any way convincing. I think it's just the fact that the eco left is more acutely aware of than the technological left. And I, I think this is something that we need to integrate in a successful synthesis of these two perspectives. But the potential for the long term looks still similar to the Star Trek sort of utopian accelerationist view as well. It's just, it's been a, a, a more ecological container from first principles. Right. And I think it's pretty simpatico with both sides account of themselves in relation to the other, but it's just the specific situation we have involves phasing out fossil fuels in a way that is going to have a little bit of short-term discomfort, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, to prevent worse long-term discomfort. But even that short-term discomfort, I feel like, is mitigated by... There's so many things where like, you don't need high energy to have luxury. There's a lot of things that are just like kind of swappable. Doing things in a less energy-intensive way that is, for the most part, just as good. I don't want to say there's like no discomforts that would be necessary to massively decrease fossil fuel outputs, but they, I feel like there's a lot of things that would be both ecological and a lateral move, if not better in terms of like the experiential aspect of it. Yeah. I mean, reducing people's work hours, commoning libraries, yeah, like these are all things that in the short term can make people's lives much better, even if the plethora of energy that we are used to is curtailed by capping fossil fuel use. So the degrowthists point out, and they're correct, we are using an increasing amount of energy and raw resource materials and we're past the amount which is considered to be sustainable over the long term. At the same time, we have this commitment to luxury and giving people a transition that doesn't have painful but especially unnecessary sacrifices on behalf of people when we can give them the best life possible. We want our transition to work in both of these realities at the same time and understand that where they come together has something to tell us about what the transition should be. And the answer to that is library socialism, the commoning of public goods. Increasing rewilding, increasing public transit, increasing renewable energy, increasing free time, increasing access to information, culture, increasing democracy, while at the same time decreasing animal agriculture, decreasing military, decreasing unnecessary production and like producing things that aren't good, aren't built to last, aren't sustainable, aren't ecological, aren't accessible. The bounties of commoning will be more apparent to the average person than areas of the productive economy slowing. In a lot of ways, like on Earth, uh, <laughs> we have enough stuff in certain sectors where like, we don't necessarily need a year of production of certain subtypes of objects. Like There is sufficient amount of objects for our use on the planet Earth in total. Like, for example, like we got enough spatulas, like no more manufacturing spatulas for an entire year. Like, let's see if we really start feeling that spatula pressure before we turn on the <laughs> spatula button again. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> um, I'm not suggesting that as, yeah, I mean, as a strategy, but it's a context that's interesting because it's true. It's like, do we have enough? Uh, we have you, enough spatulas, but we just don't currently have the social system so that if your spatula breaks, it's easy to go and get another one of the available spatulas yeah, or repair it. your spatula. Exactly. In current society, the only way to have a spatula if your spatula breaks, unless you are really good at fixing I don't know, is to go buy another newly produced one made from raw material. If 2024, we didn't make a single goddamn new cell phone on the entire planet, do you think there would be people who, and you imagine the sum total of cell phones floating out there in the world in cabinets and dresser drawers and- And all the parts in those cell phones and which one, like where is there three cell phones that can be combined to make one cell phone that still works? Like one has a broken screen, one has a, you know, you 
Yeah. And where do you have someone who has uh, a lot of working phones? In, in, <laughs> well, who's who's hoarding phones right now? Where is right, this, right, these right. piles of unused phones? And how can we? Just uh, a Scrooge McDuck with his room full of phones that he just uses to, to swim in like a pool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's probably no phone villains in that sense. And I think a lot of people would feel great to be relieved of their last five iPhone models if they felt the process was fair and they weren't getting ripped off and so on. Yeah. Absolutely. But the <laughs> iPhone should be designed in a way that you can repair it from the get-go instead of being locked out and having stuff designed in such a way that it's an impenetrable brick for profit. So after it breaks down, it needs to be returned to the company or turned into waste. Like, Yeah, this is a shift in like production that needs to happen at like a base level of like thinking about everything we produce in these terms of modularity, rebuildability, repairability. So if, if we took a cell phone production pause for I don't, probably even like 36 months, there's so many phones around that exist that are capable of being repaired or used. The, we could increase the amount of people who have access to a phone from what it's currently at while also not producing anymore. There's a lot of like mitigation of environmental damage that could have by having a you know humanitarian pause on the deployment of mass consumer technology. Well, just until we figure out what's going on and then yeah. come back with modable, repairable, redesigned, et cetera. You know, there's a lot of ways that we can approach it. And I think it's important that we approach it from a democratic perspective, because I think one of the natural fears, and it's a rightful fear, is like when you get a bunch of government guys getting together to decide what people are allowed and not allowed to do. It's not like a super killer record of like everyone loving with and agreeing the decisions of government's like small groups of people making decisions that affect the vast majority of people. That's why you got to increase the democracy. Yeah, exactly. So people having a, a democratic say in this process is important. Yeah, I think you mentioned like you don't have like an authoritarian government just imposing these things on people. If we start doing the library stuff first, combining these like three phones that could be one phone, fixing the phones that exist, creating this system where if there's a spatula, you can go get someone else's spatula who handed it in when they moved in with their partner and combined two households and no longer needed two spatulas. So they gave one away. There's That one's available to you, so you don't have to get a new one. If we start doing that first, then the pause in production wouldn't have to be like this imposed thing, on, you know, like first, it would just be a result of like, oh, we already have enough spatulas. We don't, we don't actually, need, and then maybe eventually we start needing to produce more spatulas. But for now, we just realized we actually don't need to. So we stopped for a while. And that's in general with the ecological luxury stuff and the library socialism stuff in general, like these are things that we think should happen. These are things that I want to happen, but I, I don't want it. I, I want people to want it to happen in order for it to happen. You know, like I want there to be the force of people agreeing with the premise of taking radical action on climate. Our ideal vision of this is to yeah, facilitate start... a democratic and participatory process. Building systems that make things for people, make things accessible to people that people want to participate in because they see the immediate benefit of it. Providing these luxuries to people that are ecological and people find them useful and convenient and attractive and comfortable and they want to keep using them and then shifting power to those institutions, not by forcing people, but by attracting them through the wonderful luxury that we're like trying to build here it's like people doing it because they want to do it yeah in terms of the energy thing i think that the degrowth the sort of energy pessimist side of we don't have enough energy is right especially in terms of our current infrastructure and like near future immediate what has to happen now and i think the techno optimist energy side is right in that if we keep working at creating sustainable, ecological ways of producing energy, we can produce an abundant amount of energy to the point where we can, you know, maybe not quote unquote, use as much as we want, but use as much as we would want to meet our need. Like you can't do everything in the most energy intense way just for shits and giggles, but you can do everything you want to do in a way that's using the least amount of energy possible, but enough to do all the things you want to do. Yeah, and I think generally that possible and desirable trajectory that we just laid out, the lateral transition to a commons economy that involves a decrease in the use of fossil fuels, followed by a technological renaissance that 
grows over time and eventually can increase energy capacity is how we hold room in, in our heart for both sides of these this wonderful utopian dialectic. Yeah, uh, That's ecological luxury in terms of what it looks like uh, in relation to the energy debate. Papa and boy. Petroleum Papa, I want french fries that taste just as good, but are good for me too. What is this nonsense, solar punk boy? That's not real. I just think it's possible. It could taste just as good, but also be good for you. It's I think not we, possible. We need to it invent it. It could never it. be possible. Now eat your unhealthy fries. Petroleum Papa, fossil fuel father, in other words. Yes, that's me. I heard on the Seriously Wrong podcast that you can have your cake and eat it too, if you're smart. If you're clever about it. I, t I told you to stop listening to them, boy. That's Dad, I'm a social ecological luxurian and library socialist. You have to accept that. I'm a solar punk boy. No, we are a plastic family, an oil family, a fossil fuel family. An ecologically beautiful, luxurious, vibrant world is possible, Dad. I'm sorry, but it's true. Boy, don't make me punish you. We support smog in this household. You know, Papa, sometimes when you mix two metals, they're both weak, and then you mix them together, and the alloy metal is stronger than either of the original metals. That's synergy. That's complementarity. That's what we're trying to do on a society-wide level. A, a usufructian library economy. Complete recycling. Full repair. Rich urban ecosystems that embed humanity in nature and provide for everyone without ecological offense. Oh, the ecology's offended by the fossil fuels now? Really, this cancel culture is going too far, boy. When are you going to give up these childish utopian dreams? They're not childish, and they're not dreams. They're utopian realities. It's a type of reality called a potentiality, Dad. I've already explained this. Potentialities are, in a sense, real. Keep saying that. I'm going to put you to work on the family oil rig until you're an oil boy like your oil papa. Get you to breathe in some plastic fumes. Set your head straight. Papa, I'm working on developing an advanced form of leisure, which I'm calling hyper-leisure, that generates art, technology, and aid for other people. It's more productive than work, and it's more restful than leisure. No, they're two opposite sides of a spectrum, boy. Leisure and work. It can't be more of both. I don't think so, Dad. I think we're going to transition to a solar punk, social, ecological, fully automated luxury degrowth society with a new utopian synthesis. Well, I don't see how that would be possible. I don't. There's no specific things that could make that happen, as far as I'm aware. Oh, no specific things that could make that happen. Yeah, you heard Tough you. words. You heard your papa. You think I don't have a big list of specific things I can make that happen, Papa? Of course you don't, boy. Nobody does. Oh, it's yeah, you're, you're, you're real confident in that, aren't, aren't you, Dad? See, that you're just stalling. If we're clever, Dad, we can have our cake and eat it, too. We'll use agrivoltaics, phyto and micro-remediation, modularity and interoperability, layered direct democracy, food forests, dome greenhouses, hempcrete, terra preta soil, decommodified urban food towers, agroecology, reforestation, new commons, solar thermal energy, velomobiles, ephemeralization, geothermal energy, urban goat herds, intercommunalism, straw bale housing, habitat restoration, total repair and complete complete recycling and the abolition of trash, democratic technological renaissance amplified by the abolition of patents and new platforms for democratic technological collaboration, and a society that does more with less dad and ensures every human being a good life without ecological offense. And that's just off the top of my head. It's called library socialism. Ecological luxury. Look it up. People your age get the internet, right? What are you, Speechless? Hey, Speechless Dad. I, we're changing your name to Speechless Dad. I, I mean, I'd have Solar to Google. Solar Punk Boy and Speechless Dad. I, I'd have to Google all of those uh -uh, things and I'll uh -uh, see. Uh -uh, I don't know sorry. if that... I'm doing a dolphin-style dance around you, like wiggling back and forth. Uh, 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 uh. Papa and Boy. <laughs> Today's episode of Seriously Wrong is brought to you by electrified personal and mass public transit as part of a layered usufructian urban transportation strategy which tears up the roads and turns the city into a lush living ecosystem. Cars are an inefficient and resource hungry method of transportation. 
and roads, when combined with street-level parking, take up anywhere between 30 to 60% of our city's surface area. That should all be ripped up and replaced with trees, plants, animals, and forests, other buildings. In an ecologically luxurious society, this concrete blight on our living space will be eliminated in favor of a combination of energy-efficient transportation systems that, together and layered, provide more convenience and luxury than the current unecological concrete transportation systems we're used to. Through a combination of underground subway train networks, along with above-ground trails made with permeable materials for smaller, more personalized vehicles like bikes, velomobiles, e-bikes, cargo cycles, and smaller electric vehicles similar to golf carts, we can create a fast, reliable, energy-efficient transportation network that is accessible to everyone, regardless of their mobility needs. External electrified power sources can reduce or eliminate the need for batteries in electrified public transit systems. Personal rapid transit can increase both convenience and efficiency by designing dynamically detachable train cars that can chain up and break off from one another as needed to take people more directly from one stop to another within a train system and reduce or eliminate stops between their starting point and destination. It's more convenient than the trains of the current world. Pedal bicycles and other human-powered transportation are elegant and luxurious pieces of engineering and will likely be the primary day-to-day -day form of transportation used by many residents of the ecological city because of its unique synergistic health and ecological benefits. And they can easily be circulated and maintained based on usufructian principles. The same is true of Chinese wheelbarrows, a highly efficient form of human-powered cargo transportation Many types of transportation, including but not limited to Chinese wheelbarrows, can be augmented with sails, which are deployable in the right conditions to harvest wind power. Making every neighborhood green and beautiful with abundant access to healthy food stores, library depots, entertainment functions, community meeting places, and so on, combined with normalizing remote work options, can reduce the need to travel in the first place. An important part of making transportation sustainable is by making our transportation system fit people's actual needs instead of the needs that happen to be manufactured by our current punishing work culture, our unecological society, and the world that we have inherited. We can have an ecologically luxurious, layered, electrified transit system that is more convenient, more effective, and more efficient than our current one in an ecological society. Electrified personal and mass public transit as part of a layered usufructian urban transportation strategy which tears up the roads and turns the city into a lush living ecosystem. Proud sponsor of today's episode. I think one of the cultural shifts that would happen or that is part of ecological luxury is a culture of noticing where things are inefficient and being able to bring those to the attention of a society and a society that's committed to figuring out solutions for all of these things. You know, it's kind of similar in a way to full recycling or full repair. It's like, I want a way to fully capture all of the outstanding tasks that are necessary for like a climate transition, for making things more energy efficient and kind of like crowdsourcing that. I don't know. I keep thinking about in my building. I live in an old building. It has a boiler that heats the building and they just turn it on in the winter and turn it off in the summer. And I have no thermostat. And so when it's warm in my apartment, I open my window and the radiator is right beside the window. So that prevents it from getting too warm in the apartment because I just let the heat go out the window. I'm always just like, oh, that's so horrible. But in order to fix that, this would need to be like logged and society would need to be like, okay, we are going to fix this old building and prevent all this useless energy we're pumping out into heating the outdoors, installing more modern systems. This is just like one inefficiency that I notice in my apartment because I'm in my apartment all the time. The world is full of these things. And in an ecologically luxurious society, there's like a place where you can put this up and be like, we should fix this thing. And there's a place where people who want to help fixing those things can help do that, can be trained into doing that. They, you know, like the orientation of society is like, let's notice all of these places where society is just inefficient in little casual ways that 
aren't noticed or are noticed, but not by managers. And the another part of this to me is like workplaces. Often you notice things where you're just like, oh, that's wasteful and stupid. Why are we throwing this stuff out? When this food away when we could give it to people the day before it expires. But because of like corporate cultures and things, like it's never addressed. We're just going to continually produce food to be thrown out at grocery stores rather than giving it away because our society has no method for recourse when we notice these things. Everyone sees these inefficiencies around them. And so many people would want to help fix them if that was an option. Yeah, no, that uh, that actually makes me, th- that would be part of a utopian synthesized, like complete whole, but there, there might actually be some like prefigurative potential there. Like if you set up a place for people to notice waste in public and like have a public log, especially where you start getting like reputations involved, like that that's oh, your, yeah. re- your rental company's fucking up with your shit and they need to do an upgrade. And right, they, right, right. There's no place to pressure them to do that, even if it's been noticed not just by you, but by other people. Right. So like, yeah. And similarly, like imagine you're, you're working at uh, these progressive companies, you, you know, your lush cosmetics and your whole foods and the, the type of waste that goes unnoticed or the type of waste that goes unnoticed, but has nowhere to be logged. It's really important. I think there's something there. Because their whole reputation, like especially where people's reputation, it, it, it should be caught up on everyone's reputation, but in particular where people's reputation is, is caught up on not wasting. Waste being noticed may be a beneficial tactic. A very non-aggressive tactic too. It's just literally looking at something in public, being seen, noticing me, noticing them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Like almost like Yelp or like Glassdoor, but for ecologically non-optimal processes. Yeah, they, I think that'd be great. But it would also be great if like there was like a, the power of an institution behind it. Yeah, to... the power of an institution behind it. And like if you were like, oh, hey, I want to like actually fix this thing. And not that I'm against making employers pay for it. Like if, yeah, we force employers to pay people to do it in a capitalist society, that's great. But I also like the idea of it being like voluntary, like people who want to fix these things could go out and fix them and like, yeah, yeah, that's a little more the utopian. Yeah, uto- yeah. in the current dystopian society, we got to force employers to pay for it using the government. In the utopian society, it would be all volunteer, and it would be like people who see these things, like I want to fix that. You'd be able to, like, the society would enable that for you. But hey, forcing employers to pay for it, providing jobs for people doing things that are helping the ecology—that's great. I love that. The concept of participatory ecological. Address uh, engineering inefficiencies and yeah, designing for ecological luxury and having it be a participatory process. I think that's a really profound aspect of so like everyone has has less time at work as part of this transition too, and that time can be used obviously any way that people want to use it, and that's the whole point of it. But one of the things that we might ask people to use that time for is to participate in thinking about the transition itself. And like, we've talked a little bit about intellectual property and the opening up of the internet libraries and how that makes everyone richer in experience in ways that are hard to put into monetary terms because they're so large. But another aspect of intellectual property in this transition is like the patent system. Development for profit is done behind closed doors in a way that is intended to protect their innovations. And if something can't be made profitable, it might just be hidden away and not shared. It'd be much better to have a system where people are collaboratively participating in the development of things without an uh, incentive for, or even just a personal sense of ownership over ideas, but instead having a participatory collective participation thing that, you know, experts obviously first and foremost would be engaging with necessarily, but Anyone has the ability in some sense or another to participate in the process of witnessing this and giving feedback on it. And this is a democratic process that we've never had. It's a freedom we've never had in our existing life, but I think it's really important because even lay people often have insights into things like they're capable. They don't have training, but they, they have the ability to make educated guesses or ask good questions or clarifying questions and so on. So finding the right methodology for that interface between cutting edge research, including design research, including technological research, and having access to all information in an open sense, and also having a participatory aspect to it, I think could really, in the sense that the fully automated luxury communists talk about, unlock 
technological innovation on a scale that capitalism has been unable to do because people will spend their free time to learn about this stuff and get passionate about it. Yeah, there's a lot of technological, like sort of a tinkering impulse among people that is hampered on purpose by the people currently designing our technology for like intellectual property reasons. The process of technological innovation is inherently fascinating to uh, yeah, our like, minds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like if you're like a person who likes to hyper focus on something, try and figure out a problem and like be like, really get into the details on like some individual thing. I think like, yeah. It would be a popular thing to for the, focus energy on. Exactly the type of people who would be into this. This is like their ultimate utopia. So I'm, I'm telling to you right now, we're trying to design your ultimate utopia where you can get your eyes in there. You can think about the cutting edge shit. You can leave a comment and be part of it. And, and you have access to the education and training and et cetera that it would take to move upwards to become an expert yourself. That door is always open to everyone. Yeah, all these people whose now hyper focus is being forced by companies into like designing DRM software or um, how to drill more oil or whatever <laughs> would be instead unleashed on the process of like environmentally optimizing society for the most amount of luxury, for the least amount of ecological impact, or for the most ecological harmony at the same time. I think, in effect, with this sort of open information participatory culture around innovation and technology and like making it a publicly shared and participatory project it would create a technological renaissance it would create a new frontiers of luxury and ecology yeah i mean if, if, if that's the research focus too is like we're looking for this principle to effectively create luxury while meeting environmental limits we're looking to create a good life for everyone create the most advanced technology possible while using sustainable practices, materials, and so on, and developing new ways to do that. There's just huge frontiers of what is possible. And I think just at this point is necessary. Like there's a lot of technology we have that we could deploy now that would be very helpful in mitigating the climate situation that we've inherited. But there's also things that we need to do that we don't know how to do yet. Yeah. And it's a weird thing because like there's a sort of capitalist techno optimism that you know, there's constantly like right around the corner, things are being promised that are going to like make things revolutionarily better for the customer only if you buy our product or if you uh, invest in our company or whatever. There's like, we can't limit the production of new technology. We're going to miss out on the metaverse revolution next year. And <laughs> like, if we go a year without releasing new, <laughs> new yeah. hardware, we will be totally fucked when it comes to virtual reality. God, if we, the metaverse, I feel like really just does need to be put on pause. Like, I'm not saying we could never build a metaverse, but until we figured out all this other stuff, like, that's And this that's could be one a democratic really... question, and look, I'll, I'll stay Honestly, agnostic like, should on we it. put the metaverse on <laughs> I'll pause? I'll stay agnostic. Should we put the metaverse on pause until we figure out the ecological crisis situation? And then maybe have the stats on how much resources are being put towards the yeah. development of this metaverse. But yeah, so, yeah, the thing I was going to say, the difference between that sort of like advertising copy techno optimism where they're like lying to you about what their technology is capable of because they want investment money or they want customers. It's just like a completely different thing than actually allowing the people who are thinking through these problems, who are engineers, who are like noticing inefficiencies or thinking of creative ways to address inefficiencies, the technological engineering, scientific, intellectual might of the human race is all being directed towards the goal of making profit rather than the goal of ecological luxury. So like, it's not some naive techno optimistic thing to say that if we put human creativity and intellect towards this problem that we will find new frontiers of ecologically luxurious technology and systems and ways of doing things and working together like that's just true when humans put our minds to things we come up with novel solutions creative solutions and we make progress towards things capitalist techno optimism is laughable because it's not their true goal most of the time to actually make people's lives better. It's like to make profit for themselves.
So I think we could have a real technological renaissance if we democratize the development of technology through the abolition of patents and collaborative platforms that give people access to information. I think people want to help, but we just have to get out of their way. Provide platforms and avenues and opportunities for the people who already want to help to help. Yeah, it's kind of sad when you think of all the wasted energy and potential out there in terms of people who want to be part of the solution, who would love to be involved in development, implementation, and thinking about these big problems that we face as a species and, and thinking about the technology that we need to make our lives better. And they're, uh, they don't have those options under the current system. Welcome back to Possibility Watch, the only show that interviews various possible contingent futures to see what is in store for humanity's future. This week, we are looking at various futures where humanity has tried to implement ecological luxury. We're excited to find out whether these experiments have turned into future utopias or dystopias. Usually on the show, we get a healthy mix of both. All right. First up, Universe A. We got you on the line. Hello. Oh, I love this show. Good to Hi. see you. Oh, great. Can you tell us about your future ecological? Yeah, in our Dometopia, we use domes. Oh, uh, Dometopia. We have an ecological Dometopia, I would say. To protect from climate events, we have enormous domes that go over entire cities and we climate control. We have tropical environments, even in cold places and stuff. We lived in domes for hundreds of years uh, at this point, actually. Uh, wow, that does sound really cool. Is that because of the tensile strength of domes? The You got it. Bucky. But Buckminster Fuller is part on, of your history as well. He's on our money here, which is tied to an energy standard. Oh, really? Fascinating. Domes can cover larger areas with less materials, more efficiency and stuff. The Dome Corps are our number one employer. I work for the Dome Corps myself. Uh, you make domes? Yeah, and repair. I'd say I'm a dome expert, but pretty much everyone you talk to is a dome expert around here. And uh, what powers your domes? We use fossil fuels, but we really? use only one thimble full of gasoline for an entire life cycle for uh, an engine. Oh, uh, that doesn't seem too bad. Then. One one small thimble full of gasoline is all it takes because it's so efficient. And mm, uh, right. then we have a full capture system. So the carbon capture happens inside the car and then a brick of carbon is sort of laid like an egg every 200,000 miles. But the cars can go in water or they can fly like planes as well. And just it's the oh, wow, same both as the same vehicle. Yeah, it's the same as driving to us. We don't even it's like changing gears. If you were in the back seat, you would, wouldn't even look up from your book. Wow, that sounds fun. I, w I would love to visit your reality someday. Yeah, there's a perfect cycle where we capture all pollution. And, you know, pollution is just materials that you aren't capturing and using. So is every building in your society a dome? Yes. Or? Sometimes we have domes within domes and very rarely. And, but occasionally we have a dome within a dome within a dome. People are saying there might even be four layers of domes in some places in the near future. Wow, which that's I a hope, lot of domes. I hope. I honestly hope for it because domes, they have got a lot of tensile strength. They use less materials. Like, I'm a big fan of domes. I'm not just saying that because we have domes on the other side of the money. I mean, we vote on this stuff. We vote by telephone every single day. Not like an app, but like a phone call. Oh, so there's just agreeance democratically that domes are the way? I mean, some people vote against domes. I don't know why they act out that way, but I guess when something has become so normal, it's in the background, like domes are to us. You'd have to have a good reason to challenge it, and that doesn't show up. Do you have domes in, in your world? A few. Not a lot. Um, oh, bro. Most buildings are kind of rectangles, or like, what's a <sighs> three-dimensional rectangle called? So, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I don't know. Some ugly shape. I mean, we have some decent-looking buildings. I mean, I do love domes, and I love the idea of a dome over the city. Anyway, we are out of time. Thank you so much for sharing your future world. And You would say it's a utopia? It sounds pretty utopian. Yeah, it's great. Thank you so much. Well, that was fascinating. What a banging way to start the show. I'm excited. Let's dive right into Universe B, and we will hope for another ecological luxury utopia. Hmm? Let's find out. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you too. Thank you for coming on the show and tell us about your possible future. It's a possible future for us, real present for you. Some of the things that we do, we pause energy once a week. First, we turned off all the energy that wasn't necessary for one day a week. We had a variety of clubs and stuff like that, but we lived a low energy lifestyle for just one day a week. And that helped us identify in the system. It made us capable of pausing, which is really useful. And we've kept up that tradition of pausing one day a week just to do non 
electric things. I like it. It, it. it makes budgeting our energy on the other days a lot easier. Fascinating. And obviously, while the sun is gone, we do nighttime rationing. We don't have a lot of battery capacity, but that's by choice. It's, it's a fine way to live. And you have enough food, energy, uh, everything kind of you need to live? Or oh, is yeah. this kind of a... 100%. Tons of abundant fresh food, great cooking, a lot of free time. We barely work at all. And everything is basically made out of wood. Oh, that sounds great. Free time. I like that. Yeah, and wood. wood, A lot of wood, just w- to wood? emphasize. Yeah, I'm all right. what do you mean by a lot of wood? Just like stuff that we... like. Wood is like 50% carbon, and oh. we needed to capture lots of carbon, so we invested sort of our technological focus on finding new ways to preserve wood for the long term. Oh, so you have sort of a library socialist type society? And yeah. you make a lot of things out of wood to store carbon in the wood of the things that you're building to last a really long time. And we just like wood. You know, wood is a nice strong material. Here's my wooden laptop. It's a laptop oh, computer. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And was that sufficient to pull carbon out of your atmosphere? Just put it into th- th- items that you made? Or? No. Yeah. Nowhere near. Something people write about is like eventually it does break down. So right. we, we've been investing in other ways to change the carbon balance. But It's a temporary measure, like temporary in terms of thousands of years and taking a fraction of the total carbon, but we'll take what we can get. The universe I was just talking to sound kind of similar to yours, actually. They had a lot of domes in theirs, though. It was sort of... Domes. You don't have domes in your society? Go watch my words. I'll be polite, but I think the sick domist ideology was defeated pretty definitively in the Great War. Domist? I don't, yeah, I don't know about the history of your, your world. Well, but clearly not. <laughs> is there anything else interesting you can tell me about you? Well, when I was a kid, you know, like a lot of kids, I wanted to be an astronaut. But as I got older, I realized there's a certain dignity in being a scuba diver in the sunken cities looking for salvageable materials like my parents did before me. So you have astronauts in your society? Oh, yeah. You were mentioning low-tech options, so I didn't... Lots of wood, too. You don't... Obviously, you're not going to build spaceships out of wood, but... No, yeah, we don't use only wood. Yeah, we were in space. We have, like, a space colony. Uh, Nine million people live on the moon. Really successful. I mean, it's all done with environmental limits. Of course. And we build shit out of wood up there, too. Like, if you go inside the... Oh, you have, like, a dome up there that where you build... No! Oh, sorry. I just... In space, I thought maybe you used a dome. No, we don't have domes. I forgot about the dome wars. It's just a beautiful square, big square room. Sort of like a rectangle, but it's... Three-dimensional. Three-dimensional. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love that shape. Glad to hear that. And it's not made out of wood. We have a fleet of asteroid mining robots that bring down rare earth minerals to the moon base and then later down to earth. So we have a pretty sustainable supply of uh, ability to build up our tech capacity. This sounds like a fascinating world. Bit of a strange aversion to domes, but, you know, pretty utopian overall. Thank you so much for coming on. All right. Well, let's move right on to Universe C and... Oh, wait. Uh, call. Hello? No, not again. You didn't... Just, yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Okay, bye. Jerry, I gotta go. I can't finish the episode. Family emergency at home. How are we gonna do it without you? My cat is stuck behind the sofa again, so I gotta go. If someone else tries to get Mr. Whiskers out, they're just gonna scare him further into the sofa. Yeah, you know the drill, Jerry. It's I'm the only one who can get him out. He doesn't trust anyone else. I just, it's better I deal with it now. Hey, kid. You said you were looking for your big break? The kid's gonna do it. You can do it, kid. He's always wanted to. Now's shot. Fuck everyone, the kid. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. <clears throat> uh, our first host has unfortunately had to deal with a cat-related incident. Next up, we'll be calling Universe C. Hello, Universe C, you're on the line. Hey, Possibility Watch. Anything you want to share us about your ecological luxurian universe? Yeah, first thing I want to say is that our entire society is kind of like self-organized pods. So we call them social modules of people who've organized online to perform specific tasks or to work together on different things. And they sort of confederate together through this online app ecosystem to vote on larger projects, but they can also break off and split off. You know, you form online pods with anyone and you start doing democracy together, connect to everyone else doing democracy together. Bing, bang, boom, you got a global democracy. It's beautiful. It's bottom up, real tech inspired. It's a sort of democratic foundation of our society. How, do, how is this ecological? In what way is this ecological? And oh, it's, it's so ecological. 
ecological. One of the first things we did was set up an app where people donate all their stuff to the commoning institution of society, and then you can use the app to take stuff out. So your society is a library economy as well? Yeah, I would definitely classify it as a library economy, all through the, the library app. One of the things that made the biggest difference in our society was it kind of started as a jobs guarantee under the old political system with a kind of gig economy twist where people could report inefficiencies in society. You know, oh, this building needs to be weatherized, finding items that needed to be repaired, recoding software to eliminate bloat. The accessibility database is a big part of this too. People say, hey, this building could be made more accessible if we widen the doorways. Hey, there should be different lighting options in this public space here and people you know do the work to implement the technological solutions to those problems after they're noticed put into the system and then people can fix the problems that need to be fixed and then you'd get paid in the old system to take care of it in the gig economy thing nowadays you don't really get paid to do it it's more like there's you know leaderboards you can get treats or sometimes you can jump in the library queue there's a whole bunch of sort of algorithmic tweaks we've made to you know make it fun to keep contributing but mostly people just want to contribute because it's satisfying right you open up the app you say oh hey this building a few blocks away from me needs some like upgrades to its heating system i know how to do that i've done courses on that at the local makerspace slash workshop slash teaching each other how to do stuff IRL meetup space so it's all very voluntary it's individuals doing what they want to do it's ecological it's uh, it's beautiful and so the last universe we were speaking to on the program informed us that they had a very large scale and active space program uh, what state is your space program in sorry space program no do you, you don't know about the history of our society the beloved twins who perished in space. I'm not familiar with this because at all. Of could the you, arrogance of man to leave the planet. Could you explain for our uh, listeners, beloved twins, who were they? What happened? Back in the day, there was a pod who tried to create space travel, everyday space travel, they called it. They'd been blogging the whole thing for years. People got to know and love this family, this pod of people, and the two cute little twins, the, the darling little twins that we all loved. They did their maiden voyage. Let me say, that live stream where, the, where those twins crashed and burned in the shuttle, it traumatized all of us. And uh, since then, we've all just agreed to not pursue that. We, anyone who suggests space travel in this society gets voted down immediately. You get spammed with pictures of the twins, and I think rightly so. Space travel is dangerous, pointless. We don't need it. We have what we need here on the planet. We can live ecologically within the boundaries of what's available here, and we don't need to see any more dead twins. I'm so sorry for what you and your people went through. They just had so much life ahead of them. I would say that people of our world stand with you and your twins. Thank you for saying that. Uh, that's all the time we have for this call, so thank you for joining us from Universe C. Best to you and yours, and rest in peace to the twins. Universe D, are you on the line? Hi! Hi! How's it going? My name is Jiminy Earthling. I am Capitalist Thomas. Well, it's very nice to meet you. Thanks for being on the show. What can you tell us about your world? Uh, well, we are big on private property here. Yeah, we put it ahead of everything else. Including ecology, and especially ecology. There's a system, technically, where you can, like, offset damage you do using elaborate sort of points. And what it amounts to is you can do whatever you want as long as you're wealthy. We sort of put carbon in the atmosphere indefinitely in an accelerating rate, and we pretend that we care, and like, oh, we're gonna st we need yeah, to we change this. Yeah, we gotta slow it down, we gotta yeah. stop it. But then we don't, and then we just blame the powerless people and say, like, oh, you bought the wrong things, you idiot, you know? And I mean, hit them with the newspaper. To be fair to us, they did buy the wrong things. Yeah, that's, yeah, I mean, they, they had the choice. It's kind of true. So, what else is our society like? We, ma we manufacture things actually to break easily because you right. make more money that way. When things break easily, you throw them out and then you buy another one. And it's like way more efficient in terms of maximizing the amount of money that you make. Yeah, and the money is needed to incentivize people to make high-quality products, so you're kind of in a bind. And then we just tell people, throw it out, don't repair it. Garbage forever, forget about it, pretend yeah, we'll it doesn't exist. Create a landfill, maybe we'll throw the garbage into space at some point and turn space into our trash can. Yeah, that'd be good. Next step. Long-term plan. Right? 
Also, there's a lot of scientists in our society that, you know, they're kind of annoying and they're always giving these dire warnings like, oh, we're crossing yet another critical boundary on the road to climate change. And we're like, okay, we get it. It's dire. Yeah, they keep warning us and warning us and we're like, okay. We get it. All right. If you're warning me now, why did you warn me before? Yeah, great point. It hasn't gotten that much worse. Uh, if you look over here in my closet, actually, this might be fun for your audience. I'll just open the door Bring here. The camera over here. And you'll see kind of comically large amount of stupid crap that I purchased once and never really used again. But it was manufactured from raw materials. And I just keep it in my closet here, sort of like, I'm too lazy to guilty. sell it. And You feel guilty, so you just carry it with you, you move a few times. Oh, yeah. Eventually, a little piece snaps off, and you're like, oh, thank God, I can throw this thing out. Yeah, it's technically broken now. So you move it a few times, and then once it's technically broken, you send it to the dump. And then you can buy a new one to right. put in your closet. I mean, it's cheaper than fixing it anyways. I mean, this is our, yeah, this is so, our utopia. Yeah, what do you think of our great utopia? That's pretty amazing, right? Better than most universes, am I right? This is deeply disturbing stuff, what you've described here. It's bizarre. Your worship of private property distorts everything. Uh, okay. Judgmental. It's, private property is essential to innovation. I thought this, this was supposed to be an ecological luxury universe. It doesn't even sound like you attempted ecological luxury. Oh, yeah, no, we do. This is, uh, we actually run a company called Ecological Luxury yeah, it's got basically a monopoly. It's like ecological luxury. It's our big company, and it sort of runs the whole world. It's like our big centralized distro. Everyone works for them, and like right, yeah, we have it on the flag. There's no nation states. We just have it on the flag directly from the corporation. And I'd say yeah, they're truly evil, right? Well, I mean, you're not allowed to criticize them, or you'll lose your job. So I, I love them myself. I love them too, but it's that's why I say my company. I think of them as mine. It's like we my company. It's like it's like we're the every worker is an owner. Yeah. In a metaphorical sense. Yeah, yeah. Because in a very literal sense, it's owned by someone else. Right. But in a metaphorical sense, it's like a family, which is good because they separate us from our families. Family time is not work time. It's a, one of the slogans of our society. All right, well, we're, uh, we're all out of time. I, we're all out of time. Goodbye. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't think I can do this. Oh, come on, kid. You did a great job. Hey, let's a round of applause. That was a great, great co-host. That, yeah. You got a rough one, kid. That's, that's not usually like that. Do you need to talk to a counselor? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, some people are just so in their own society. They don't even see how horrible it is. Those are always the toughest ones. I think the fully automated luxury communists are right about the appeal of leisure and automation and the appeal of technology for helping foment a mass political consciousness towards new egalitarian political frontiers. But I also I want to argue for the automation of the pedal bike. I want the bicycle is a beautiful example of automation. There's something elegant and automated enough about a door that locks that and like keys, doorknobs and hinges. It's automated in a way compared to cutting a hole in the wall and then patching it up every time or something like that. And like a non-electric door is kind of automated in the way that an automatic door that opens for you when you walk up to it needs to be powered by energy, which comes from somewhere. But that process is totally automated with a mechanical door. Or like a bicycle is an amplification of human capacity to be able to move faster with less energy and less effort and so on. So it's sort of a type of automation that increases leisure and, and so on. On. Yeah, all technology is a kind of automation in a way, like a lock, locking a door rather than like standing in front of the door and holding it shut. A hammer is an automated thing when compared to trying to push in a nail with your thumb. The automatic door example is a bit harder for me to wrap my head around, but if we're talking about automation as the process of making it so that certain human actions no longer need to be taken because the technology makes them obsolete, with a uh, automatic door, you have to like hook it up to electricity, you have to make sure there's a power grid, you have to make sure all the mechanical parts are operating properly, you know, it might break down a lot more easily than a sort of standard non-automatic door. There's a lot of extra things you have to do for an automatic door that you don't have to do for a manual door. So in that sense, yeah, like a manual door, like it's kind of the powering of it isn't fully automatic because a human has to 
take the action to open it, but no human has to take the action of hooking it up to a power grid and powering it. Like, yeah, like doing all that stuff. It's a, it's a mind twisty version of it, but yeah, in general, I agree that like all or most technology is a type of automation. There's something really beautiful about giving different options. Yeah, I don't, maybe I'm crazy for thinking this, but I would just I would love to have the option to like manually open and close a garage door alongside the automated thing. Like it doesn't need to just be one. A turn crank to use my blender is appealing to me. But like the tactileness, the connectedness to the mechanics of it and like I want to argue for full automation but also in the context of like full tactile mechanical you know, like hands-on automation, yes, but the world needs to also stay hands-on. The world needs to get more hands-on. The weird thing about the phrase fully automated, like you're fully gives this idea of like, you never have to touch anything. You never have to turn a crank or t pedal your own bike or uh, yeah, do like- Your the, muscles the, will just <laughs> shrink down to nothing. We'll just- <laughs> Yeah, you'll just like everyone will be put in a bodysuit and you'll never, they'll walk for you and like AI will decide what you are going to say and put on your and hover then, backpack and you'll be dragged around with your toes scraping the ground. Like, I think that level of full automation is a, a sort of is a straw man. Yeah, like, but not, not even that. Even like the Apple store future thing, like, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes of like that kind of thing to always like fix the Bluetooth things and like, I think. Suf like we've used the phrase sufficient automation before. What types of sufficient automation will be different for different people? Some people really will want all doors to just open up for them because opening doors is difficult. Other people are like, yeah, like usually I can just like open a door and that's great. And having like different options or just having things automated enough to where the bulk of the horribleness is gone. Like having a washing machine is great. Having a washing machine that folded all my laundry for me, honestly, I would probably accept that level of like an upgrade on level of automation. But like, I don't need it to like undress me and collect all the clothes and then like fill my dresser again for me. Maybe we could invent that. But I yeah, there's like a, a level of automation. And it's like different for different things. And we already have that like, you know, people haven't gotten rid of whisks just because you have electric mixers. For some things like a hand whisk is just more convenient. Yeah, like the cranks and things you're talking about, that reminds me of like steampunky vibe. That's what I think of. I know it sounds weird to be like, oh, this is utopian. I wish there was more utopian cranks and I wish more, I wish my blender was manual. <laughs> but yeah, genuinely, I think, I mean, like it's ideal to have both. I think it's ideal to have both and have norms towards contributing human energy when you can um, and like valuing that human energy because it's also synergistic. Like it's a benefit if I save battery power so this is assuming an environment where we don't have like, you know, exceptional energy abundance, which I don't rule out that there could just one day be so much energy that we don't know what to do with all of it. Yeah, we just figure out fusion or solar panels become so effective and efficient that everything is always at 100% no matter how much you use it. Yeah, there's something synergetic between saving energy by providing energy and the way that your body is positively impacted by engaging in like active movement. I think there's a real value to tactile things in life being hands-on to feeling the textures of different things yeah to write on paper and not always write on screen you know the feeling of a typewriter or even a mechanical keyboard compared to like a touchscreen keyboard i hate touch buttons on things sorry this is just like a small thing but like give me a fucking real button <laughs> like, oh yeah i've I had these like earbuds that I've purchased a few times and they recently upgraded them to be touch things. So now every time I take them in and out of my oh, ear, God. it pauses. It's just like, I literally had to go buy new earbuds just because it made me so angry to use the touch earbud. And the main criteria I used to find new earbuds was has a real button on it rather than and most of them don't. I went to the library today and I rode the SkyTrain and I had to load up my transit card with a touch screen right and it kept not registering my button press or registering slightly to the left of where it should be and like the screen's dirty and shit too and it's like yeah give me a fucking mechanical button that i can press that's like right. refill card beep if the one screen experience i could have when buying tickets from machines and shit was like an led text screen that would send one little message at a time that's directly relevant no pop-ups of like oh it's transit week no pop-ups like <laughs> oh, fucking God. 
Yeah, none of this shit. It's like I want a nice metal button, color coded, really clear concession. Right. You know, that kind of, and I want to like press it in and feel the click. Right. That, what you said really resonated with me there. Touchscreens have their place. They're great. I'm glad we invented them. I like the touchscreen on my smartphone. Every other touchscreen that exists should go away. Parking things are like, I bought a kitchen scale that has touch buttons. And if I drip water on it, it presses the button. Horrible. No, it's you're you're so right. And it's such a great example of Yeah, where what, steampunk is better than Apple Store. Yeah, and just yeah, and, and and how ecological luxury as a political movement appreciates both the leisure of automation and the tactileness of really participating in the world. Yeah, not looking in through glass. Hand. Yeah, yeah. We now go to a guy meeting his friend down at the crank for a drink. Geet, geet. Reggie, good to see you. I Thanks ordered for you a, coming. Oh, no problem. I ordered you a Yerbe Mate. You know me so well. Uh, so do you want to position yourself on this side of the giant turning crank that goes down to the basement to generate electricity and I'll go over here? Yeah, sure. Well, let me just double check. Uh, some of the pads are worn off on the crank and I always like to choose one of the pedals that have nice padding on it. But yeah, let's uh, let's position ourselves and start turning this crank. All right. Yeah, once we get it going, we can keep it going a little easier. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, it's just that initial. <clears throat> oh, there you go. There we go. Oh, it's yeah. nicely designed this where we can look at each other while we're turning this big crank yeah what a feat of engineering that's uh, an important part of social cranking being able to look your friends in the eyes i'm glad to get the exercise too so it's i, I wouldn't usually comment on how great this design is you know because it's so normal to us we do this all mm-hmm. the time yeah but yeah and sometimes it's important to stop and smell the roses and appreciate things that are extremely normal in your life but amazing nonetheless here you go, boys. Two yerba mates on the house as usual because we live in a cash-free society. Thank you. It's wild to think that there was ever a time before people would enjoy beverages together socially at, down at the crank. Yeah, you said it, man. <laughs> it's just weird to think that people actually live in their whole lives without doing this. And, like, what, are they just sitting there? They're just contorting their body into a little Yeah, sitting. like a sitting position. Like, who wants to sit for that long? What about their spines? Yeah. I mean, like, I don't mind a sit as a rest. Oh, Sometimes. a sit now and then, sure, but when you're having a drink with, with a no friend, crank? Yeah, it's a perfect time to crank a little for some social cranking. Yeah, it feels good, and it helps everyone. Like, sometimes when I, I'm walking down the street and I walk by a cafe and I look in the, I look in no, the window see and see everyone cranking, cranking with their friends, yeah. then I feel taken care of in a way. Absolutely. And, you know, I think the tea just tastes sweeter when the energy to heat it was cranked out right there locally fresh i mean local cranked energy is more efficient yeah no need to send it across the country you can crank it right there i mean that's just the way i was raised cranking starts in the home yeah what happened to good old-fashioned cranking family values that's what i say and that was a guy meeting his friend down at the crank for a drink and now back to our show Hey there, cool cats. Welcome to Ecotech Jazz Corner. The only smooth jazz radio show that brings you ecological technologies each and every week. And uh, how was your week? Oh, I'm doing positively ecological. Thank you for asking. How about yourself? Ecological as well. Also technological. Smooth technological weekend. Ecological and technological, well, that goes together like peanut butter and jelly. That goes together like saxophone and drums. I like to think of it like the ecology is the salt and technology is the pepper. And then the jazz is that delicious umami flavor on top. Let's get into the eco-technology. Ooh, yeah. Solar electricity is increasingly cheap to produce and is a major source of energy for future ecological luxury but a large amount of available energy is not captured and converted. Further energy is lost in our systems by converting that energy into heat for ovens, factories, and heating systems. These two inefficiencies reduce the viability of solar to meet our needs overall. But there is an alternative, solar thermal energy, capturing the heat of the sun directly and deploying it towards the ends of heating up what needs to be heated up when the sunlight is available. As part of an energy mix that provides for everyone without ecological offense, solar thermal is indispensable. 
Passive building design can create ultra-low energy buildings that utilize combinations of solar gain windows, super insulation, heat recovery air exchangers, hot water recovery, thermal collectors, and other building design techniques to store and distribute solar energy in the form of heat in the winter and to reject solar heat in the summer to create buildings that use very little energy for heating or cooling. The internal temperature of a functioning compost gets warm. A John Payne system is a coiled pipe full of water, which can utilize the heat energy of composting to heat water tanks, houses, and other similar heating uses. Sodium ion batteries can be made from materials far more abundant and accessible than lithium ion batteries. But our excess renewable electricity can also be stored and deployed in various ways that are not typical batteries made from mined materials. Electricity can be used to pump water back and forth in tanks or natural bodies of water like lakes, using gravity and hydropower as a means to store energy. Energy can also be stored as heat in sand, as compressed air, or stored through other mechanical mechanisms that can later be deployed at will. Power to gas can convert excess electricity to hydrogen, which can be stored, transported, and used on demand. The 17th century technology, the Tromp, is a simple device with no moving parts that turns the movement of flowing water in streams or rivers and turns it into compressed air. Any place where we have flowing water, we can produce compressed air tanks that can function as batteries, with that air being used to turn turbines or generate electricity. By preserving 10% of croplands for rewilding efforts, you can reduce soil loss by 95% phosphorus loss by 90% and nitrogen loss by 85%, increasing soil quality and preventing groundwater contamination. This practice, which is called prairie strips, increases biodiversity and provides habitat for important bird and insect populations that help control pests and act as pollinators. Buckminster Fuller advocated for dome-based construction because domes have a few beneficial structural properties for doing more with less. Firstly, they're structurally efficient and require less materials to make a stronger structure, resilient against external forces. In most construction, a higher level of redundant checks and balances are used to protect the integrity of a structure. But domes have an efficient load distribution that can have the same integrity with less materials. Fuller noted that dome's integrity is the result of the internal tension of the dome, which he titled tensegrity. Domes also have less surface area than alternative structures, and as a result, save on energy for heating and cooling. In extreme environments, domes can even be put over entire villages for efficient climate control in cold or dry conditions. Electric velomobiles are a type of aerodynamic, weather-protected, personal bike which optimizes ergonomics and aerodynamics for maximum efficiency, and when electrified, can travel as fast as cars with 80% less energy use. They utilize electricity for acceleration and steady pedaling from the user to maintain speed. If we converted all U.S. work commutes from car trips to velomobile trips, it would take only one quarter of existing U.S. wind energy infrastructure to power them. If these same trips were taken in an electric car, it would take 20 times the current U.S. wind infrastructure. Human-powered inputs like pedals and cranks have a larger role to play in an integrated energy mix. Many tools like blenders and garage doors can easily be powered directly by humans in the vast majority of cases if we set up the modular infrastructure to alternate between electricity use and human power at will. For example, in many gyms you have rows of exercise bikes dispersing human energy into the ether, while at the same time coal-powered televisions play the news for the people on the bikes. That inefficiency can be easily patched. Most gym equipment could be redesigned to capture the wasted energy of human workouts. And it's also possible to integrate cranks, pedals, and other human-powered devices to feed back into the energy grid the same way solar power does. If we had people's already existing exertion and exercise feed into available energy on the grid, we can do more with less and have a more ecological and luxurious society. That is some sweet ecological technology. Ooh, 
Yeah, you know the way that you uh, tap your toe to some good jazz when you're having a good time? Yep. I feel that way about these ideas. I'm sort of tapping my idea toe to these ideas beat. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm picking up what's being put down here. There's something very smooth, luxurious. Sometimes I imagine a world where the whole world is tapping their feet to that beat, that ecological technology beat, what we could accomplish. Sometimes jazz is about the notes you don't play, and sometimes ecological technology is about the technologies you don't use. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential in technology. Like we're talking about techno-optimism and how I think the response to that is like a lot of well-warranted skepticism about specific claims made of what's possible. But like something that gets lost in that response to corporate techno-optimism is just the fact that if you look at the history of technology, even just the technology that we currently have, sometimes technology not only does everything it promised it could do, it does way more and does really amazing, cool things that you would never have dreamed possible. Even just living in a society with mostly horse-drawn carriages or coal-powered trains, imagining the current level of transportation technology and like vehicles and cars and there's problems with a lot of technology and a lot of the advances come with concerns for the environment and like how they're designed and whether they're designed to work within the bounds of the system of nature. But even within working within the bounds of the system of nature, there's a lot that we already know we can do. And I think the frontiers of what's possible is basically only as limited as our imagination is. Technology really does fundamentally reshape human life over time. And you consider what's possible now. The fact that you're listening to this right now as someone who isn't local to Aaron's living room here in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, where we record the podcast. Yeah. That's a, a surprisingly recent innovation. Yeah, nothing even like this was close to possible until bef like the radio. But then even then that was like a you needed like a whole radio tower to do radio and like the sketches and stuff we do, the sound effects and music that we get from libraries back in the early age of radio, this would be like a high budget production, but we can just yeah. do it ourselves even basically. Even in like the 1980s, it would be like you'd have to pay for editors to edit audio tapes together and mix them and like re-record and like putting together a radio play production on this level with just two people on the staff as we've done for 10 years probably started to be possible when we were in Doing our teen it. years yeah or like slightly <laughs> within the decade before we we started doing it I guess on a more general point on technology, technology isn't just cool, and it's not just interesting how it reshapes our lives. For many people, technology fundamentally makes their lives immeasurably better in ways that we take for granted. For example, glasses. It's something we figured out as people how to make these glass panes that right. help people see. And it's life changing. It means they can drive cars. It means they can. Yeah, it's such a weird, like you can just show someone a series of increasingly smaller letters and ask them how blurry they are and look in their eye with the light and figure out, okay, this is what type of shape the glass needs to be cut into to bend the light. It's amazing. Like it is really, really cool, but it's also life changing for people who use glasses. Yeah, and it's life-changing for all of us to live in a world where, you know, our neighbors, friends, family who need glasses are able to see and participate fully. Like, it makes people who need glasses freer in a way, but it also makes us all freer in a way. There's a lot of things that we take for granted in our life that are completely mediated by technology that we would not want to lose, including and especially the information communications technology that we have now with the ability to send information and files and communications all around the world and be connected across geographic barriers. Again, very, very recent. We're in the early stages, the early decades of this being the social reality for human beings. And I'm still ultimately an optimist about what that means for our species. No, yeah, me too. Yeah, I think it's easy to slip into some of the like more critical views on the internet and like it's given us a lot of new potential, but it's also created 
new problems, which I think we should anticipate with any type of technology. Generally, there's going to be benefits and challenges that come with it. But I think like, yeah, I'm also a techno optimist at heart. I was thinking about AI recently, and like we did a two part episode on AI, and we were very critical of it, or at least critical of a lot of the claims being made about it. And we did talk a little bit about how AI is cool in that episode, but I feel like maybe gave it a bit of short shrift. And like, there's a lot of really interesting potential for AI technologies, like for machine learning, the things that we're calling AI currently. Specifically, if we're talking about fully automated luxury communism, I think AI helping with automation, it seems really likely to me that it would be really good at that kind of thing. Because we were talking about how machine learning can't like go beyond its programming to do creative things, or it's only good at very specific tasks or like doing what you prompt it to do. But that's perfect for automating drudgerous labor that people don't want to be doing anyway. People already use it to automate shit that they don't want to do. Like, People whose job it is to write chat GPT like corporate speak text for things. I've uh, talked to people being like, this has like liberated me from so much work at my job already. So like yeah. combining robotics with machine learning things that are able to, like I saw this video of a robot sorting these blocks and it like kind of dropped one and it landed side. Seeing it sort these blocks into two different piles by color and noticing when one dropped and then being able to pick it up and put it so that it wasn't on its side anymore. I was like, yeah, fuck. Yeah, the, the use of machine learning for like adaptive sorting of materials is potentially, I think, a liberatory thing. Like we've talked before on the show about how a lot of problems with like waste in our society are actually like sorting problems. Right. Things are ending up in the dump that should actually be getting recycled. And under capitalism, everything is in the wrong place. And under library socialism, everything should be in the right place. Right. <laughs> so if machine learning can do that successfully, then that's great. Cause like we need to like microplastics, for example, are a problem of sorting. Right. Uh, there's all these little pieces of plastic, which are sorted into the wrong place, like inside the soft tissue of our brain, for example. So <laughs> we, yeah, I would love to sort that out, sort that right out of my brain. <laughs> yeah. So is machine learning sufficient to do all sorting things for us? I don't think so. But I think potentially machine learning and AI could be part of sorting in certain environments. Yeah, like sorting through dumps would not be a fun job. If we can have like robots do that using some type of machine learning, that would be awesome. Yeah, and if we want to get like tech utopian about it, there's, there's kind of like dangerous, scary versions of this too. But sorting nanobots uh, seems like a natural sort of like technological frontier to think about. Yeah, if I think about nanobots flying into my brain to control <laughs> my brain from some malevolent force, I hate that. But if I'm thinking of nanobots flying into my brain to remove microplastics, increase blood flow, you know, like make it so that I feel like really focused and like on the mark or something, uh, that would be awesome. Uh <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, like a medical robot that can go in your body and like scan. Oh, yeah, you if it's removing like... brain cancer when it goes in there. I would, I'd be like, get those nanobots in. Yeah, like... I'd be like, put those, yeah, put those nanobots inside my body if you're going to be able to scrape the brain cancer out of my brain. Yeah, and keep the no brain more. good. Yeah, where can I sign? The more powerful a technology is, the more burden of proof I think is required before they can ever be deployed to like, so that we know they're not being used for nefarious ends. Yeah, I'd say I'm broadly in favor of brain cancer fighting nanobots if there is such a path that arises. Yeah, me too. At the same time, developing powerful technologies also necessitates developing defenses against the potential misuse of those technologies. Yeah, powerful democratic social structures that give people a say in the development and deployment of the technologies. I think a lot of the technologies that people tend to be excited about, they're excited about because they're potentially liberatory. One of the ones that I always, it's got a space in my heart is vertical farms and like food towers. Yeah, there's something really elegant and like being like, oh, it's, you know, condensed space wise. You can just like grow all this food like right there. It's local, you know, be close by, it'd be like less shipping, less of a footprint. You can yeah. rewild more. Yeah, more nature for the animals and we can just build our own little like food ecosystems. And like we're going out there into the countryside 
when we're taking these ecosystems of a bunch of different types of things in it, and then we're reducing it to a monocrop because we want corn. And then we're just growing our corn there at the expense of everything else. And it's like, well, you could just build your own corn tower and just fill it up with <laughs> as much corn as you want. Or yeah, I don't know that vertical towers would necessarily be monocrops. But at the very least, if you did do a monocrop, it wouldn't be at the expense of an ecology. Right. Yeah. It's more contained. It's yeah. So yeah, that's that's one of the techno things that I'm really stoked about co-developing during the technological renaissance with all of you in the democratic techno revolution. Yeah, there's a lot of like, I think, good critiques of like existing ideas for these towers. And like, obviously, we shouldn't implement them globally until they're proven to be ecological and like viable. But yeah, I think I think it's something we should definitely keep working on. Uh, because it's like, if we can figure that out, the liberatory potential and the ecological potential is really, really high. And like, as far as I understand, it's like mostly like an energy issue at this point, like efficiency. And that's like the kind of thing you can keep iterating on and creating better versions of until you've passed the threshold where it's viable. We've mentioned it earlier in the episode, but I'm also a fan of uh, asteroid mining. Just the concept of it is just like cool. We shouldn't treat space like a garbage can. Like, I know it seems big, but like the stuff that we put in space is going to persist in the orbits of things near. This is just a side point I want to make. There was a time when the ocean seemed infinite and we just threw garbage in it. And right. then eventually we figured out, oh, it's not infinite. All the garbage is still there. And we can recognize now that was a mistake. I think there is going to be a day when we're like, actually, it turns out that even though space is really big, uh, we can't treat space as a big garbage can. But I was inspired when I read the book Fully Automated Luxury Communism by Aaron Bastani. One of the things that he mentioned in that book where I was like, now we're cooking, this is interesting, is he was talking about a fleet of automated mining robots that self-fuel on hydrogen that's found on the asteroids that they're mining. And it just opened up this realm of like, that's really cool. Like, yeah. maybe it's not feasible. Maybe, you know, like, obviously, there's maybe some more important things in the world in the short term. Uh, Definitely. Th but at the same time, like, why shut the door to that? Like, why... I think having a critical perspective on the promises of tech is good, but at the same time, like that science fiction kind of utopian spirit is is a nourishing thing for political action and for thinking about the world we want to create. And I think there is a world that I would be interested in being that includes asteroid mining for like rare earth minerals to make more batteries and whatnot. Definitely. Like there's a lot to figure out there with, you know, space travel is expensive in terms of energy and maybe we need like space elevators or like I said, with food towers, there's going to need to be iterations before this technology is viable. But there's something conceptually about asteroid mining that I really like, which is that mining on Earth has a lot of like really big downsides in terms of like damage to the surrounding ecology. And asteroids, they're just like big rocks. And if we can go out to the big rocks and get like the metals and stuff that we need, rather than digging around in our ecologies on our planet to do that, there's something like really elegant and it feels like deeply ecological about that. Again, we have to iterate past the energy concerns and like, you know, fossil fuel, like we can't just go to space a bunch right now and do that. But like the idea that it's just like inherently bad or we shouldn't be looking to space is uh, closing down possibilities that could be really ecological and give us like a greater pool of resources to uh, thrive with. So yeah, I really like asteroid mining too. On the subject of energy, and it's also kind of connected to using more with less, but it's something that requires, I think, a technological renaissance and a serious development trajectory. But there was like this proof of concept of when people step down, their like body weight pushes on the cement or the floor and it creates force and that force can be captured as energy. They were able to like power the lights of a hallway from people walking down the hallway. So it's like a small amount of energy and the amount of infrastructure it takes to build it up for the amount of energy you get. I think there's a mismatch right now. Right. But the premise of capturing, like direct capturing in an integrated way, the places where energy is already being expended in the system is just beautiful like i would love to know that there's thousands of people working on this right now of like right. yeah. when all this excess energy that just dissipates like we give the example earlier in the episode of the exercise bikes in front of the tv the tv is being powered by coal energy and the exercise bike is releasing energy into the ether 
capturing all of this in like an integrated energy capture system it scratches my like buckminster fuller big brain utopian kind of idea like to the degree that's feasible i'm in favor of implementing it entirely that stuff is like such a brain tickler I think I talked about hot water capture. It was one of the things in the passive house thing before, but like the idea that like your hot water going down the drain after you shower has heat in it, that's energy. And then it's just like, we just drain it out into the sewers and like let the heat energy dissipate. That's a real technology people are already talking about because heat energy is actually like really valuable and like thinking about homes in terms of solar thermal or like moving heat and where heat should be used. It's a version of that capturing technology or capturing energy that already exists. I went to this electric car expo thing, mostly so a friend of mine could test drive all the expensive electric cars. And it was really fun. And they can go really fast, really quickly in ways that gasoline engines can't. And like, yeah, electric cars aren't my preferred transportation method of the future that everyone's going to use in all situations, but they are really cool technology. And one of the ways they do this thing that you were talking about is there were some speakers talking about how capturing the energy from braking in these things works so good now that when you're in BC driving in the mountains, when you're going downhill, your charge generally is going up rather than down because it's capturing so much electricity from right. your braking when you're going down the mountains. Yeah, so the friction of the brake pad is being captured as energy that's being used to charge the battery of the vehicle. Yeah. Yeah, that's extremely dope. And like gasoline engines lose so much energy to heat. I think it was like 80 or 90% or something of the energy isn't used to actually propel the vehicle forward. It's just like making your engine really hot. Well, I mean, that's what I want in a car. It's like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's the, I just want the front third of the car to be really hot. Right. So yeah. please spend 80% of the energy on that. And like, say no more, sir. And they make the adjustments to the car. Oh, you know, another technology, like one of those sort of pie in the sky, maybe not worth it things like the, the street that captures the pressure of people walking on it is solar paint. I've seen people talk about like you can paint a house or a roof or anything, a car with paint that captures solar energy and then it can be used to charge things or put it into the grid. The idea of, of like being able to capture as much of the sun's energy hitting the surface of the earth as possible and especially like at point of source where it's going to be used because uh, that's one of the really cool things about solar panels in general is that like if you have solar panels like on your house or whatever or your building and you're using that electricity there in your house and your building there's like a huge efficiency benefit to using electricity that was generated like literally right beside you it doesn't have to be transported anywhere yeah because a bunch of energy is lost as it moves along the wires right yeah the distributed nature of solar panels and how flexible they are and how useful they are like at this point you can like create more energy than you're using just by having solar panels on your house if you have a house and not an apartment in most places you can do that there's, there's something really powerful about like things being able to just generate their own power at source where they are cutting down on the need for things like power plants in general. Like when you think of like all, almost all power plants, there's always fucking problems with them. Hydroelectric dams fucking up the surrounding environments, coal or like fossil fuel ones pumping shit into the solar panels are awesome. I think like solar panels are a big part of one of those revolutionary technologies that are just like starting to really, I think, really feel the impact of them. Yeah, I think the fully automated luxurians are right. The cornucopians here are right about how cool this tech stuff is, how it's like exciting. And you can imagine a, a cool, wonderful society that includes the implementations of good machine learning, asteroid mining, jobs being automated that suck. I'm in favor of all that. But I also, I feel like the low tech Low tech is even the right word. Low tech feels like you're talking about like your most basic hammer or something, but something like a Velomobile, the thing that uses a combination of aerodynamics and human power and batteries to like achieve car level performance with way, way less energy use. That's still, it's high tech in a way. It's not computerized. It doesn't, it's not running code. It doesn't have LCD screens on it, but that level of engineering to be able to achieve that kind of thing is high tech in a way. Those sorts of like low tech, high tech things, I think are also really, really exciting and cool. But I think 
what won't work is if the technological trajectory that we try to get on is through the existing system where every year we use more and more materials, produce more and more stuff than the year before, more and st more stuff that's built to break, more and more useless disposable shit, quantity over quality, slightly bigger TV every year, you know, slightly brighter LCDs or deeper blacks. Come on. That's what it's all about for the TVs right now. That's why OLED is so good. Yeah, and hey, don't get me wrong, I've got no problem with deeper blacks. In fact, I'm on the market for some deeper blacks myself once my paycheck clears. <laughs> but the <laughs> I've got no problem with deeper blacks in theory. But in the way that our current technological system works under capitalism, it's, it's run for a short-term profit, sometimes at the expense of consumers, always at the expense of the environment. None of the tech industry is sustainable at all in terms of hardware manufacturing. Every year in order to justify marketing to a narrow subset of consumers who always buys the newest thing and gets rid of the last thing. So to make sure that they buy something every year, they manufacture devices that don't need to exist. Manufacturing billions of cell phones when we already have too many cell phones to meet everyone's needs. And again, I don't have a problem with, you know, progress on better and better cell phones and stuff, but we need to approach it in a modable, rational, a way that understands that there is a finite amount of resources available. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. This TV I have here is like six months old. It's a new TV. The old one was discolored. Like there was like weird colored strips on it that were like distracting. But like, I don't know what part of the tv the old one needs to be replaced to fix that uh, but if it was like built in like an ecologically modular way where you can like find whatever the you know easily access the information first of all for which part needs to be changed and then be able to get just that part and change it out i would have done that rather than getting a new one because this isn't even an oled tv it doesn't even have deeper blacks i couldn't afford that They're way too expensive so I just yeah. got the same kind of TV that I had before. It's a bit thinner and newer for sure, but that's about it. And my old one, I just put behind the sofa to deal with, what, I don't know, sometimes it's just, it's just sitting <laughs> back there. I put it out of my sight and was like, yeah, I'll figure that out sometime. Because you're not supposed to leave them by the trash can. So you like drive it somewhere, I guess. I'll just leave it behind the sofa. And I mean, this is why this is exact. This is why we're library socialists because yeah. we're we're dehumanized by this whole process. Like now you're guilty. Now you're this guilty <laughs> trash dragger <laughs> that you always have this fucking weight around your neck until. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere Aaron goes now, he's got this metaphorical chain connected to this broken television that must someday be dealt with, yeah. weighing down his heart. When it's probably the case that a better working TV could have an easily subbable single part that could be ordered directly, that would be cheaper than buying a new television, would cause the existing television to work sufficiently. And upgrades too could also happen in a more modular way. You know, there's like a new kind of phone screen technology that's better. Uh, you don't have to like make all new phones. If screens were modular, you could just make new screens to fit onto the old phones. So yeah, like, yeah, the technology is great, but part of the ecological aspect of it isn't just like advancing the technology until it gets better, until it's like ecological suddenly. It's thinking about how we use the technology. All the things we've been talking about the whole episode, building it to last, making it modular, making it shareable through a library's commoning system, having a fully realized full recycling system so that items are captured and repaired or broken down into parts and those parts used for another thing. This episode of Seriously Wrong is proudly brought to you by the symbiotic synergetic complementarity of a full circulation economy, library socialism, and a layered direct democracy. Library socialism makes full use of humanity's physical and intellectual resources using engineering and design to respect material goods, never using more than is needed, and using the social technology of sharing to create a more abundant, fuller symbiotic whole. Direct democracy is an extension of this principle, recognizing that reason is a group process and that our group decisions can be strengthened by making space for everyone to have their needs, perspectives, and contributions taken seriously and made full use of. 
We are all collectively more knowledgeable than any of us can be individually, and taking advantages of the vast differences in knowledge and experience in a population through democratic processes is called swarm intelligence. It's not important that everyone knows everything, only that the people who do know about a given subject are given platform to have their perspectives reflected in group action. And similarly, in production, repair, recycling, and the structures of a library economy, a confederation of collaborative specializations can make the whole function greater than the sum of its parts. Buckminster Fuller's principle of tensegrity, the types of integrity that come through tension in building materials, also applies to the democratic process, where the productive tensions between differing voices within democratic engagement and discussion can strengthen our ability to make decisions that positively impact our society and our ecosystems. A democratic tensegrity. In order to have time for democracy, we need less compulsory labor. And less compulsory labor is highly compatible with maintenance and repair over raw production. And less raw production is highly compatible with our overall climate goals, which are also enriched by the repair economy and the library economy. Democracy is also highly compatible with climate. Just think about it. Over the era where climate change has become an acute threat due to human activity, there was almost no participatory ecological democracy to speak of at all. It's structures of hierarchy and domination that prioritize their own personal well-being over the ecological system. People working together in a democratic system, looking at the best evidence and listening to the best expertise, will work together to actualize an ecological society because that is in all of our common interests. All of these suggestions are not only good in and of themselves, they are synergistic with one another, bringing out more from each other by working together. As a whole, they are more than the sum of their parts. Together, along with rewilding large areas of the planet and the integration of ecosystems into our lives, as well as the abolition of intellectual property to spur on an ecological technological renaissance, this is ecological luxury. The symbiotic synergetic complementarity of a full circulation economy, library socialism, and a layered direct democracy, proud sponsor of Seriously Wrong. Now back to our show. We now go to Bysworth, on his deathbed, with his son, Little Billy Bysworth, at his side, giving his final statement. Oh, Billy, as I look back on my life as an oligarch, a collector of items, of things, it's... Oh, I see something now, boy. Oh, yeah? Is it how to make more money, get more stuff? You want some last minute stock tips for little Billy? Something you want to give me right now? The code to a secret safe with extra billions? No, boy. It was all, it was all hollow. Boy, this sickness, the sickness of having, of needing to accumulate. No. It's pa cheapened Papa, my life. Pa it Papa, destroyed our world. Papa Bysworth, you and love accumulating. You love having. Stop. You're being silly. What? Stop you can't it. take it with you, boy. And I'm glad you can't. I can finally be free of it. Whoa, this is the this is the death delusions talking. I don't know what this is. This is Look look what it did to you. All this money. I mean you always said that I was your precious little Billy Bysworth and you were proud of me. You no matter what. You and... are Billy, but you personally cause animals to go extinct. That was one time. That was... But it was three animals in one instance. And I said that I was sorry. And we got you out of that mess. Yeah, you did. No, but look, this idea of private property, this idea of hoarding, we're killing the planet over it. My generation, we would have... We would have killed the whole thing. This is crazy talk, Pop. You're sounding like those people who want to take our yacht away. I realize now, boy, they're right. Now this next part here won't make any sense unless we explain the yacht grandfathering system in post-library socialist revolutionary wrongtown. During the transition as a token of goodwill, the middle class and rich were allowed to keep a certain amount of privately owned luxuries that, during the transition to a library socialist property relations, they could keep. 
In the case of the Bysworth family specifically, he opted to hold on to his precious darling super yacht. The policy, agreed upon by the Confederation, is to allow these grandfathered luxuries to persist until the death of the property holder. When Bysworth dies, his luxury yacht is going to the boat depot for processing. This is a problem for little Billy Bysworth because he lives on that luxury yacht. They're right, little Billy Bysworth. No. And it's going to the boat depot, no, whether we I, like it or not. I was hoping some last minute advice on that, maybe actually, how I could keep it. Uh, My honest advice let go. That, no, that's. Let the current just, wash you into other how you know under the society there's enough housing you will have housing nonetheless yeah but it won't be better than everybody else's and won't be on the ocean like Look, it won't be as maybe beautiful I, I realize now that the boat isn't better than the not boat that was just a lie we told ourselves to feel better than everyone else uh but we are better than everybody else we're not billy this is when i die i'm going to be begging whoever judges us to see me as the same as them uh, it's always the saddest when they lose it at the end like this. Let go of the family yacht. The library socialists are right. You can have access to everything you want and more through the ecological power of sharing and direct democracy. It's a good, it's a good revolution, boy. I see that now. I see that clearly. Uh, definitely feel like I'm about to die. Do you have anything that you want to, uh, like, do you want to have a tender moment? <sighs> Yeah, I don't know. I'm just kind of, I'm kind of pissed at you right now because you're being such a dick right before you die. But oh, dick, what was that? What are you talking about? Telling me to give up the yacht and so I don't know. I don't. Yeah, well, let's have a precious to, moment. It's well, not up to me. I'm not like. What would you want me to do? Uh, I'm not in charge of yachts. Tell me how to escape with the yacht and keep it. How to overthrow society uh, back to the way it was before. Why don't you tell me how to fly upwards with no wings? I don't know. I just thought you'd bail me out one last time with this yacht thing before I died. I don't know. I'm literally. I'm about to die, and I'm talking. You're talking about me bailing you out from. Yeah, for old times' sake, one last time. For I always thought that was your love language. It's kind of our thing. I'm Papa and little Billy bailing them out. You know. Goodbye, son. I'm going into the light. Tell Spensworth I love him. <laughs> no. 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 The boat is gone. The boat. I can't believe it's <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor. It can't be over. I'm so I... sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh, thank you. Now, this won't make any sense unless we explain in the library economy in Wrongtown, when someone's vital signs finish, it sends a signal to a room full of professional comforters to make sure that no one is alone with the loss of a loved one. They're going to take my boat away. <laughs> They're going to take there. my boat away. They're there. They're <laughs> there. Your father was a strong boat of a man. You're right. <laughs> I've lived on that boat since I was a boy. I can't believe it's really gone. <laughs> no, I won't accept it. I won't let them take my boat away. Um, there, there. Everything's going to be all right. Gone He's gone now. That means I have to be the man of the house. I have to be the one to make problems go away. That's right. Disappear when they're inconvenient. But just take some time to grieve. Everything's going to be okay. Find your center uh, before you go take action. Just take some I, time for you. I wish I could, but there's no time. They're coming for the boat. I have to get my weapons. I'm starting to lose the boat metaphor. Metaphor? At this, at this point, with your father being a boat that you've lived on since you were no, a boy. No, I, I live on a boat. Oh. All right. Interesting. But he owns it, and they're going to take it away. Right. And I'm going to stop him. That's what I've resolved due to this conversation. Thank you for helping me realize that it's time for me to take a stand against this society. We all process grief in different ways. Your father obviously meant quite a, a lot to you. And this fantasy is a way of centering yourself right now. You know, if I succeed, you'll get your own boat too. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's a little wink. It's a Billy Bysworth wink. Well, thank you, Billy Bysworth. Order in the court. 
Order in the court. Little Billy Bysworth, you stand here accused of the heinous crime of maliciously sinking your family yacht to prevent its expropriation for use by the People's Assemblies. How do you plead? Your Honor, I plead civil disobedience. (gasps) I did sink that ship, but it was not mere property destruction without a purpose. There was a political message behind it, which is protected by the Library Socialist Constitution. For you see, a society where all can own yachts is a society where great men have nothing to strive for. Great men like myself and my father, entrepreneurs who made the world what it is today, who built this thing from the ground up. That's me, and our society today keeps us down. And as long as we aren't allowed to own private yachts or private heated swimming pools or private jets or any number of other private things just for us that other people can't have, then there is a rot at the heart of this society that needs to be excised. Thank you. All right, we will keep that spirited and uh, interesting defense in mind while issuing sentencing. I find you guilty, and I'm going to sentence you to making things right. I'm going to give you like a little bit of lenience or whatever, because it's political disobedience, but still you can't do that. You can't sink the, the political excuse doesn't fly. You can appeal it if you want, whatever, but I'm just telling you that's not going to fly. Not under this system. So I'm going to sentence you to first, we need to make restitution for the sinking of the yacht. The yacht needed to be pulled up. They brought it to a place. They dried it off. Now they're repairing the yacht from where you shot holes in it. This took fuel, energy, man hours. So once all that's calculated, you're going to have to do that many hours of work. The amount of energy it took to do it, you're going to have to generate via stationary bicycle. Again, I don't make the rules. I just enforce them. I can't give you much leniency on this. So that's, you have to make that basic restitution. This is totalitarianism, fascism. Uh, Secondly, you're going to be assigned a lifestyle coach who can help identify the needs you have that were being met by that yacht and then can help you to meet those needs within the library system so you feel, you know, a valued member of society. Just because you did this doesn't mean we don't accept you and want to welcome you and, you know, give you all the luxuries that everyone's entitled to. And I think your needs can be met if uh, if you open up your mind a little bit. (laughs) Poison apple dipped in sugar is still poison. And finally, you're going to be sentenced to court-mandated video blogging about your journey. As I'm sure you're aware, we've got a large audience of people who absolutely love these criminal video blogs and they comment on it they cheer for them they pick favorites they cry when they relapse they cheer when they successfully you know leave the life of crime and and so on i know it's a little bit of a humiliating and some say outdated punishment but i think in this case unfortunately some severity is warranted given the, the heinous nature of the crime and my personal advice little billy bysworth you need to make peace with bysworth dying he's really dead i think you're using this property stuff as a way to hold on to your dad. I'm sorry. I recently lost my father as well. And I just see myself in you right now. Sorry, will you give me a hug? Everybody, everybody get out of the stands and come big group hug. Let's show him he's welcome. He's going through a lot right now. Let's not dogpile him. You're one of us, buddy. You're one of us. You're always going to be welcome in our world. And I'll just pop out that tape. Uh, Well, there you have it, folks. Three beautiful hours of ecological luxury. This has been our our season nine finale. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for listening. Our longest episode ever. I feel accomplished. It's uh... Yeah, and this season nine, it's our second longest season ever. And longest season in terms of how many months it lasted. Like when you say second longest, you're talking about in terms of number of episodes, in which case it's the second longest behind the first season. Yeah. And we're going to take a little break from releasing new episodes for just a little while so we can rest up and then start working on the next season and some other projects. But we will be back with new episodes in February. Uh, Between now and then, we will have some more bonus episodes for our Patreon community, and we'll be re-releasing some classic episodes uh, in the main feed. With brand new transcripts. 
But yeah, I'm excited to take a break. You know, this episode was a big project. It feels like a good one to end on for a bit. It's episode 300 and it's ecological luxury. I feel I really enjoyed making this episode and I hope you all enjoyed listening to it. There's something kind of, there's it's kind of ironic, like you do the show because you love it and you're working a lot on it and then you're editing yourself talking about the virtue of taking breaks and the virtue <laughs> of not <laughs> working all the time and working long. On the one hand, we're like, vacations are great. You know, we support vacations. Everybody deserves vacations all the time. Days off, we should have shorter work weeks. Uh, but then when we're like looking at the stats and like episode releases and Patreon numbers, Numbers and we're like, oh my God, no, we have to keep putting things out. We got to get right into another episode. Oh, it took three weeks or some more to finish this one. Oh my God. Yeah, it's good to take a break every now and then, no matter what you do. The human organism requires uptime and downtime. A well-rested wrong boy is a, is a sharp, thoughtful wrong boy. Exactly. Thank you all so much for listening. We will see you next time. Yeah, we will see you all very soon. And if you're subscribed on Patreon, we will see you even sooner.